I'm good. All right. 6 12 p.m. And I'll call to order the June 1st, 2024 meeting of the Manchester Essex Regional School District School Committee. School Committee. We have just had our retiree reception and we're now in business meeting open session. We'll begin with public comment. Uh, guidelines for public comment can be found in section BEDH and BEDH-E of the policy manual. Would anyone online like to make public comment? If so, please put your name and address in the chat. Is the chat open? Chat is up. Chat's open. If you're call, if you're joining us um, by phone and would like to make public comment, you can unmute yourself, say your name and address. Okay, I see no public comment online or on the phone. Would anyone in person like to make public comment? Okay, hearing none, we will close public <laughs> comment. Chairperson's report. It has been quiet on school committee items. Uh, since our last meeting, um, I have attended, um, as some of you did also, Memorial Day events at the different schools. Um, we did have, student, have student advisory council this past week. We don't have student report tonight, um, but they're working on kind of defining their group and um, putting together some um, objectives and processes for what they're going to do next year. They will have their election for a new um, student representative here, either this spring before school ends or next fall uh, to coincide with their elections. So we will know as soon as we'll let you know as soon as um, they do. Um, he's not here tonight, but since we're talking about student advisor, I think it would be out of line not to recognize um, Diego Sensum, who served for at least three years and maybe more um, diligently as a student representative to the um, school committee. Uh, my recollection of school committee is incomplete without him being part of it and um, smart, civic minded, and just gets it even quicker than we do sometimes. I think his brother's here. He can relay all of this, I'm sure, right? You got this? Thank you. Um, he's been a great ambassador um, for students, a uh, connection between our committee and the students. Mm -hmm. uh, contentious budget conversations. He organized the, um, the student QA that we did last year, which was really a highlight for me um, as far as interactions. And he's just been a good colleague for all of us. And so we really do wish him well. Um, we, of course, have had the graduation events. Um, and really, my time has been spent mostly counting down to today uh, because we have reorganization next. Um, I, I was asked recently, or not too recently, but somewhat, um, so will you be letting go of your position as chair? And I thought, it's not my to hold. And I've made it clear that I am good with this. Do you even know me is my question, really. Um, but um, we will reorganize in a moment, so I'll take the chance to just say, um, this role as chairperson is to serve uh, serve the board, to be a servant of the board. And with that, sometimes we have to do things that don't really prefer or um, or bite our tongue when we'd rather not uh, in, the, in the name of diplomacy. Um, but I am grateful for the chance to have done it, and I'm ready to let someone else do it. Um, I, I'm especially grateful for the cup filling aspects of this, which would be things like um, like speaking at the retiree reception or to the teachers and staff on the first day. Um, town meetings. I like public speaking. I enjoyed doing that even when it was hard. And I especially appreciated building relationships behind the scenes with um, our community members, our administrators, teachers, um, and students. And I'm proud of my service. So it doesn't have to be bittersweet. It can just be sweet. And I'm good with that. Um, so one thing I can say I will take from this is that I will know how to support our next chairperson really well because I know what that means. So with that, I will close my final chairperson's report and we will move on to reorganization. Thank you. So that we do this right. Um, I have pulled the policy on the school committee school committee organizational meeting. It's section BDA. Um, I'm going to explain how this goes, and then I will turn the gavel over to Pam to actually run the first election. Um, so the way this works is that there will be, um, Pam will open the floor uh, for nominations. So someone will make a nomination, then there will be a second to that nomination, and then discussion so that the person um, they can say why or what have you. If there are questions, they can be asked. Then that's repeated if there are additional nominations. Then after that, there will be a roll call vote. and. A major the person who receives the majority 
um, will receive the position of chair, and then that person will handle the election for the remaining position. So, are there any questions about how that's going to work? No. And I will. Before you hand over the gavel, just want to formally acknowledge our thanks and our appreciation for all of your hard work over the last two years. I think that it's important to recognize that you won your re-election during the same year that an override failed at the budget, that the override failed at the polls. And I think that that speaks so directly to your connection with our community. And we have been so grateful and so lucky to leverage that and to have that. I don't think that people who don't know Teresa recognize how much time Teresa spends on school committee aside from sitting around this table. It has very much been a full-time job for her over the last two years, and we couldn't be happier to have had you. And our budget passed this year. It certainly did. <laughs> You're here. Thank you. Thank you. All right, pass it over. Pass it over. We'll walk it carefully over so as not to pull out the cords. You? This just have one of the cords. Um, so I will ask for nominations for the role of chair. I'd like to nominate Chris Reed as chairperson. Is there a second? I second that discussion. I think it's important. Um, what for the discussion? Is there a second nomination? Or can we do the, the discussion as we go? That's what I was understood. Okay. I looked this up this time. Well, now I put not in my discussion. <laughs> not a discussion. Um, I think that it's important that the chair go back to a Manchester um, board member as a show of togetherness. Communities working together. And I think that Chris is the right person to do that. My nomination comes of the fact that you that you served as vice chair while well, in my first year as chair, and um, it was a level of support and also understanding our roles that I think that will really benefit us moving forward. And I'm um, confident in your skills as well. Any other? Sorry, to remember now. We're gonna need some tape. There's another wait time. Um, I totally agree you should be referring back to the interested um, rep. Um, can I ask you this? Um, knowing how much time you should spend with the chair, uh, what do, do you think that you can commit to? Um, is, is this uh, manageable for you as a chair? Because there is a lot more projects coming up. It is, yeah. Uh, I do think it's manageable. Um, you know, I, I'll just need to reset some of, you know, my expectations. Uh, <clears throat> but I do think it's much I, I do have time to do this. Uh, it may not be the same time during the day that Teresa had to do this or manage this, but I do think uh, I do have the time to do it. And I'm also, uh, you know, I think that uh, the next vice chair will also be an important role as well. Uh, because, you know, unlike Teresa, I do sometimes have some travel and school work. So, you know, vice chairs would have to work, uh, run those meetings if I wasn't able to attend. So, uh, I think that role is also going to be important this year, but I am willing to commit the time to make sure that I can effectively lead this committee this year. I thought that a lot about it. Do you want to do this? Yes. The discussion. Any secondary nominations? Uh, I would like to nominate Erica as the chair. I'll, I'll second it. Thank you. And and I apologize for doing this on the Chris, if you have the time that you want to dedicate to this, then I am happy to. Um, I, I love the idea of sharing this community. I actually really do. I like building consensus. I think we have great skill here. I have a rising senior 
who is about to embark on the college application process and everything that that year brings that I actually know how it goes. Probably if I didn't have the preview of having done this last year, I would be more ambitious of my time. But um, and I, you know, I'm so sorry because I have been asked about this and I have made a decision back and forth about 15 times. But Chris sounds like he's made a decision in one direction um, rather than two. So I'm happy to. See that nomination, but thank you, Woodford. I definitely went back and walked a little bit too. Yeah, it's a big commitment. Yeah. 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 So it appears to me the vote will be, we still have to do the roll call. It's my last thing to say. So the roll call vote will have to indicate your choice for between the two individuals for sure. Correct. Sure. Because we have, I think she declined the nomination. Yeah. But we still have a motion in a second. Well, then then why don't we withdraw our motion? Then I withdraw my motion. So then we're left with a single nomination of Chris Reed, uh, made by Teresa, seconded by Kate, with girl of the nomination of Erica by Amy and Jake. So we'll do the roll call vote. All in favor? We'll start with, do you want to call the roll? Sure. <clears throat> Let's go. Start with Teresa. Yes. Teresa Whitman. Yes. <laughs> Do I have to say Kate, my name? Or Kate Cox on the best you have to say. She's gonna read your name. You say yes or no. Yes. Erica Spencer. Yes. Anna Lincoln. Yes. Jake Foster. Yes. Eamon John Bynard. Yes. Chris gets to Chris Reed. Yes. <laughs> okay, it's unanimous. Can you use the gavel? Use the gavel. It's unanimous. Chris Reed is the new chair of the school committee. I promise to do the best job for my little bit. I'm looking to the next. And your job begins now. There you go. Well, just repeat the process for vice chair. All right. So, um, right. Yeah. All right. So, um, next order of business is to uh, repeat the same process to build the rest of the positions. So, next up would be nominations for vice chair. I don't have any particular recommendations for this. Uh, I think historically we have had a chair from Manchester and a vice chair from Essex. So the floor is open for no mentions. I'd like to nominate uh, Jake. I'll second that. Uh, or something for discussion. Um, I'll just say that uh, the reason why I nominate Jake, in addition to uh, having the essence as a bias to support you, uh, Manchester Bunch here, is I think Jake can bring a lot of education and leadership experience that can help us do the next couple of years. Um, and also to build a relationship with Essex um, and with all the different stakeholders. I'll, I'll just add, um, if we keep with our tradition of shared and coach for being finance, I'm very interested in um, that aspect of the work, particularly since, and Michelle, you've indicated that you're starting to rethink a little bit about what that budget kind of presentation or whatnot may look like. And I know I've advocated for that, so I'd like to. Uh, help see that that fight piece through. Um, I also think it's important that we reestablish relationships with our town from that perspective. So, very glad for that. Okay. I'm sorry, I'm waiting to your time discussion. Oh. Any other discussion? Mm -hmm. Any other nominations? I'd like to nominate Kate. Oh, 
okay. uh, discussion. I'm nominating Kate, who also has um, considerable educational experience um, and also has just completed with Chris the um, negotiations process. Um, and I have witnessed how she has supported me in the last two years as chairperson. And uh, I just believe that it would be a really good uh, team effort. And that's just my personal opinion. But I, I know her skills and um, think that that would be a good balance. Thank you. I'd like to say something just about that as well. Uh, so, although Kate and I might not always agree or have the same perspective on things, uh, especially over the past two years working with her on negotiations, I've really come to really respect her opinion. Uh, she's usually thinks through, you know, topics, uh, comes up with you know, extremely valuable points of view, and I do think she would be. Valuable, uh, <clears throat> valuable pledge. Any other discussion? <laughs> or any other <laughs> thoughts? I appreciate the nomination, and I would very much enjoy working to continue working with you. Um, I agree that we have not always seen things the same way, but I think that that actually leads to productive discussions and increased perspective. So I appreciate that. So with that, if uh, there is no further discussion, then we will move to vote. Okay. Uh, so by roll call or by Okay. Uh, you say everyone's name and then you say the person we're I talked about some not right. Okay. So John Benares. Walter uh, Jake. Teresa Lowe. Kate. Uh, Jake. Jake Foster. <laughs> Anna Mitchell. Jake. Uh, Eric and Spencer. <laughs> <laughs> Can you just come back? I have to go right now. I'm thinking. Sure. Thank you. Kate, uh, someone's. Kate. Kate. <laughs> uh, Christopher, say my name. That's Chris Reef. Uh, Kate. And then Erica Spencer. You can take as much time as you want. Like. The reason I'm taking time is because I think you guys are both being great, but it's wrong um, yeah. and for different reasons. And I'm starting to figure out which one of those should be best combined. I think I'm going to uh, just change my mind. <laughs> I think I, uh, I'm going to say Kate. I'm sorry, Jake. And it's just because I think that you guys have work together in a partnership that's worked and been really successful for uh, the negotiation team. And I think sometimes form a partnership. It's, I don't know why I'm speaking still. I'm sorry. I voted, but that's the basis of my vote. Okay. That's Kate is for vice chair. Um, and then next would be finance committee. Or we like made it. So, so we can choose to organize our subcommittees tonight or we can choose to do it another time but that doesn't have to be by vote in the same way that can be more discussion based and see where people are um i would leave on Pam for helping guide part of that conversation okay so how many meetings do we actually have left because i would like to set this up before um, we break this up this is the last meeting on the yes yeah. Unless we have a quorum for June 18th, but I think last time we checked in on that, we didn't have people available. So our next meeting would be August 6th. All right. So I will take an informal poll then. If you'd like to discuss this now, or do we want to table this to our next So I'll take an informal poll. I think we can do briefly get a sense. It may be very quick. It may or not, but it may be quite quick. It may be. And, and we can all, to be honest, we can also 
change this up a bit if uh, you know we're not sure exactly which positions we'd like to uh, follow the senior spectrums. All right, so about the process of maybe start with the ones where you don't anticipate change, like Jake's already can you would like to come up with policy or stay on policy and finance, but do you anticipate any changes to the negotiations team? I don't really know what the negotiations team does now. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can have some open service outstanding joint labor management right. pieces, follow-up pieces. So that doesn't mean we're going to have to sit, you know, week after week in session, but we're going to convene subgroups to work and then need to call the whole group together like they do process through the final outcome. So um, I think we left on the list stipends, which should be getting underway hopefully over the summer. Um, then I think we also have uh, let's say um, the um, complaint policy was left as a JLM, and I think there's one other that's escaping. So there could be some more fun negotiations to be done, but fairly small work and probably follow up work to the two contracts that have. So. I'm happy to stay. Involved with that it doesn't sound like it's a big commitment. Um, I don't think that it's important for that continuity. I think that there's room also to do more. Not on the negotiations. Right, right. <laughs> um, so I guess an easy way to do this would just, uh, I guess, to initially ask who would be interested in the approach. So maybe we start off, John. Start with you. No. <laughs> Teresa? Uh, so I currently serve on the uh, facility subcommittee with John, and I think that's something that we might consider just keeping in place since we have the um, EES project in place, um, and I'm certainly willing to do that. Um, I've done my time on the finance subcommittee. I, I've learned what I need to learn there. I don't mind not serving on that. I don't mind serving on it. Um, I I think that our policy and program subcommittee needs some direction and work. Um, I would be willing to serve on that, but I would also be willing not to. So whatever you need, I am willing to do, but I, I would like to stay with the facilities. Okay. Can you ask me to do what, what Teresa just said, or are you trying to fill the negotiation spot? No, 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 I'm just asking. So, okay. Sorry. Uh, just a, yeah, no, what, what, what would your intent be? What would you like to? You know what committees would you like to serve on? And then we'll see where the discrepancies are. Mm -hmm. We can start discussing. So, um, as okay. I said, I would like to stay on the negotiations, but I don't think that that in and of itself is a full time role. Um, I am. Anything else? I am happy to do policy and programs, but uh, finance would be full and third for me. So. Policy or facilities? Policy or facilities. Uh, and that's definitely not violence. Um, I guess if that's where I was proceeded, Maybe. but that wouldn't be my choice. No. Okay. Yeah. I could say on the policy, but I didn't have to. Yeah. Um, All right. Jay? I'm uh, interested in finance for reasons I've already stated. Happy to stay with policy and programming uh, that's useful. Um, that's definitely interesting finance. Yeah. And I think I would do the same. I mean, I think I could stay on negotiations. Is it remind me, Pam, is it customary for the chair to also be involved in the finance committee or how does it? It has been, but speaker with has been because it needs it needs to be. Sarah didn't. Time to share time to achieve it. It is an additional part. Yeah, because I think finance, um, it, as you mentioned, there's quite a lot of work to do. We've set the meeting schedule to be once a month next year for both committees just to try to avoid some of what we did this past week, which is some schedule. Um, just so we can have a handle on how to plan for the year because we have to produce agendas and do the postings and everything. So. We're looking at first Tuesdays for finance and third Tuesdays for policy and program. 
And I also say something, uh, yeah. since a lot of people are interested in finance, one thing I've learned from the program you have in the I think it was only you, I think it's just you and Jake. John, did yeah. you respond? No, he just said no. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I'm good on facilities. Okay. But nothing more. <laughs> All right. So I was gonna say that if there's anybody else that's interested in finding this um, one thing I learned about the program committee, having three people is a given. Uh, flexibility to have a course. So we don't have to let it, it has been difficult like, with two people to train them. So that is because we want to choose to have three people if there are people additional other than us. Sure. I, I would just suggest that with finance, it's a little bit different in that we have 50 towns being represented in that. So that's that is a one argument for just keeping it very balanced. Um, but I, I'm not here. I didn't. I, th I think I, maybe I didn't make clear to you. I am willing to not serve on finance subcommittee. So I think it's just the two of you who've expressed interest. Okay. Uh, so. And I think then Teresa, Eric, and myself had all expressed interest in policy and program. Is that correct? Or you had a willingness. I have an interest and a work, but I'm willing to do whatever's needed. Yeah. Sure. So is this how, how do we actually determine this? So I think from what I'm hearing, your negotiations are the same two people have interest. Mm -hmm. So you could vote on that group. It sounds like you have a decision to make on facilities because Erica would have interest in facilities mm -hmm. and or policy. Um, so hold on that one. Um, sounds like two people are interested in finance. Anna and Jake could vote on that one unless I missed somebody expressing interest. And then I'm missing. Facilities and policy. And facilities would stay the same. I uh, know facilities wouldn't stay the same because that was expressed interest. So you really could you could vote right now on negotiations and finance subcommittee unless there's some additional thing that you're still. So, so if you want to just make a motion, I'll make a motion that Kate and Chris be the negotiations subcommittee. Second. Any discussion? All right, we'll take a quick roll call vote, right? Uh, John? Yes. Chris? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Yes. And I'm Avis. Check the finance. Yep. Jake and Anna. Yep. So we'll go by we'll call it here. Yes. We need a motion first. Oh, we need that. Uh, sorry. Make a motion. Yeah. Second. Yeah. <laughs> Jake and Anna serve as a finance subcommittee. Okay. Second. Okay. Any discussion? Okay. Yes. Reese. Yes. Hey. Yes. Erica. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Jake. Yes. And I'm also yes. Do you want to solve the policy and program first or facilities first? That's the chair's call. Let's solve facilities first. It's more important. And I, I, I don't, I. I interpreted what you asked me. Where would you be interested in serving? I'm not going to serve on either. So, right. If, right. So, I'm going to, I will make a motion. Can I do that? Or do you want to do it? The chair is supposed to put forward a slate to be voted. So, yeah. okay. Did you bring a slate, Chris? <laughs> That's my I don't know if it really matters because like, everyone's agreeing on the outside. Um, so, then that would mean it would be John and Teresa and the mm -hmm. So as a group, does that sound yep. like a good plan? All right. So then, go ahead. Uh, so uh, if 
Erica is also interested in can the facility be three people, just like a program, or make the program become two people? Maybe that was okay. So right now, I think again, I'd like to keep it to two people. We can always see how that works, and if it does end up being a situation where there's conflicts, I think we can address that. Same and I'll just say that because of the MSBA approval of like that committee uh, as well, that complicates things. So yes. it's, it's actually probably better to have just two yeah, for that purpose only. So I'll pass it. Yeah. Yeah. So then, is there a motion? So he has presented this late. So now we make, we make a motion. Okay. Then I move that John and I continue to serve as the facility subcommittee. Is there a second? John? Yep. Yes. Yes. Eric? Yes. Eric? Yeah. Yeah. Jake? Yes. And I'm also yes. So now we're at uh, final, right? So who, remind me again? It's <laughs> program and policy. Program and policy is be three people interested. interested. Yeah. Chris, Kate, and Eric. Uh, that was a three person committee. So, sorry. Well, I know it How did it work as a three person committee? Was that a benefit? I thought there was a benefit. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, then is there a motion? I make a motion to have to raise that shape and her uh, to be in the three person policy system. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Yes. <laughs> John? Yes. Bruce? Yes. Kate? Yes. Erica? Yes. Anna? Yes. Jake? Yes. And I'm all sweets. They're all that great. Right. Here. Yeah. All right. All right. So moving on to our consent agenda. So since I wasn't uh, here on last meeting, I believe we need to break out the minutes and what? Is that correct? Okay. So, or you put them together and you. Um, all right. So, I'd like to make a motion to correct me if I did this wrong, but make a motion to accept uh, vouchers 1074 to 1076. Uh, and a roll for 5 20 24, as well as the minutes from our meeting on 5 21 24. Is there a second? Any discussion? All right, then we will vote. John? Yeah, So, all in favor? Anyone abstaining? <laughs> yes, All right, so motion passes. Uh, moving on, we're going to start with our subcommittee reports, and first up is facilities. So, with well, so is John and Teresa. Do you guys have any report? No report. No report. All right. Uh, finance subcommittee. Again, any report or no report? Uh, negotiations. We have no report. And then for policy and program, uh, Jake, Anna, and Erica, we'd like to give the report some if you guys didn't meet the right? We did we did not meet, so this is not a report per se, but it's a continuation of discussions that we started last meeting and that we want to return to try to get some closure on one and input on the other. Okay. Uh, you want me to start with the other role? Um, so at the last meeting, I went through pros and cons of the uh, request to have unenrolled students access uh, sports in particular, but we expanded that to extracurriculars uh, broadly. Um, Chris, you were not here, so after uh, some discussion and uh, back and forth, uh, we voted on it three to three. Okay, so. If you've read the minutes, then I don't really think we probably need to go back and, and recap all the pros and cons, unless you wanted to, Chris. 
this uh, maybe the highlights just to make sure that I you know, when you read it, it's maybe a bit different. So maybe sure. just the highlights of the. Yeah. So the, the initial request was from a community member who has a um, student in a private school. That private school does not offer a sport that um, the student wanted to participate in. So they asked if they could enroll in that sport here uh, at MERSD. And for clarity, it was a middle school sport. So NIA uh, regulations you know, don't factor in here. When we looked at it as a policy uh, committee, um, we tried to view it uh, from the perspective of getting the yes, uh, you know, because we think one of the key pros is community relations and participation of community members and peer networking among students. The, as we looked at the considerations, the key cons had to do with a lot of unknowns around fairness, around equity of access by any non enrolled. Uh, student from the towns. Uh, there was there was uh, concerns among the administration uh, about uh, how to administer it and um, and how to oversee uh, those students uh, if they're not held to the same consequences and and expectations that our own students could be held to because we wouldn't have oversight of that student in the same way of the of the out of non enrolled student in the same way. Um, and uh, in the context of middle school sports, which is the particular request, we have uh, uh, high enrollment numbers now. So to add to that uh, is asking a lot of the, the teams and the coaches and the administration and uh, could, although the numbers are likely small, could force us into a situation where we need to determine uh, who can actually participate in middle school, which is against our kind of uh, inclusion policy for that. Um, so overall, particularly, uh, you know, given the unknowns and given the concerns of the administration, um, we came back with a recommendation from the policy committee of take no action. In other words, leave the current practice of not allowing um, unenrolled students participation. I just wanted to, uh... So I was in the minority on the policy committee, so I'm not going to say the whole thing, but Jake, there's one thing that you just said that I'm not sure it's at least my understanding, which is. I don't think we would force any more middle school sports into a position of having to make cuts by virtue of accepting an unenrolled student. I think what could happen is the AD in the event that a sport is oversubscribed or at its maximum would have to say there's not space. I think the guardrail, guardrails that are in place for a program like this would be one that it's only available to students who don't have that extracurricular offered at their school. So when you think about the small handful of schools we're dealing with, and the fact that most of those schools have, in general, more extracurriculars than we're able to offer in public school, um, I, I don't think we're dealing with a ton of students who are going to race for this, but that my understanding, and I'm really asking this question, Jake, is that it wouldn't, we would never be opening the door to the possibility of because we accepted a student from Leonard Card. There's a student from within district that would be cut from our team. That is not a decision we would make here, but if we choose to accept this, that is the kind of guidance that we'll need to figure out with administration on what are the rules and regulation and rules and uh, kind of practices that they would follow to determine when to open it up and when not to. That kind of thing would all have to be worked out if we say yes to this. Whether or not we leave all those decisions to Pam and her staff, or we make it as policy committee, that has to be determined as well. Um, right now, there is no policy about this. It's just standard practice. Uh, we could not find another district that had, had this practice in place or policy in place either. Um, so right now, the default practice, not policy, the default practice is you, know, you have to be enrolled. So if we change that, then we need to figure out how do we manage it via policy, whether it's us, Determining that, or you know, charging Pam to determine, that. we'd have to figure that out. Did you have a response from the community member that the question was raised? Um, so the <coughs> sorry, Toby, are you good with me speaking, with Paul? Yep. Just that you're recognized when somebody to speak. Uh, yeah, my so last time when we talked about this, my position. Uh, in voting not to take no action and to continue the discussion was primarily because 
if there's no policy in place, it's just nebulous. And so what, where do we go with it? How do we solve for this? Whether it's for or against a specific circumstance, it is not really my goal. It's to, if, if, if is there, the question was, is there a void in policy on this? Um, and there were unanswered questions at the time because what I had heard from um, the person who brought forth this item was that there was another district um, that was doing such a thing, but Pam did check with that district and our understanding is that is actually not their practice. And so it may have just been lost in translation, hearsay, that kind of thing. Um, similar with, um, you know, whether or not students, whether or not this has happened, you know, in the past, is different from whether it should have happened in the past. So um, I've spent you know the last couple weeks trying to think about that, and where where I keep coming back to is a question that I kind of left Pam with last week, which is why not have a policy about this, either allowing it under certain conditions or saying we don't allow that thing. And that's why I'm sort of in in the camp of finish this out, we can give the parent, if we're, if we're going a different, a certain direction and saying this isn't something at the district that we think is manageable for our administration, or our students, or, or in alignment with our with our um, vision, why not have a policy about that? And that's the thing that I, I want to know if there are unintended con consequences, because there are other areas, especially where you brought up, you know, not just this being sports, but being all activities where this this could be an impact. So that's my main concern with forward is is there harm in having a policy one way or another? I don't know the answer. Okay. So this seems to be moving to be a bit more into starting of the debate. Yes. So, uh, it, so this is bringing up continuing business. Uh, would someone like to make a motion to continue discussion on this or to reopen this at this point? At the stance, the motion failed and there's no change. So. Right. So, would someone like to make a new motion? I will make a motion that the Policy and Programs Committee consider a policy regarding participation from unenrolled students who are residents of the district. So, I think we've already been charged with it. Yeah. Right. We we are we have brought a. Uh, recommendation. I think we need to vote on the recommendation. That was not my motion. <laughs> I, I understand. All I'm saying is that in essence, that needs to be done because the, the school committee is already charged the policy committee with that purpose, with that vote. And so we're voting on whether we will accept that we take no motion. That we take no action. Yeah. Okay. That, that was our so, recommendation. That okay. was our so then maybe you want to make the motion that we take no action. Sure, I will restate the motion that I made last time, which is the um, this. I made a motion that uh, we take no action on this request, thereby maintaining the existing practice. Is there a second? Okay. Discussion. So my question is is really for Pam on this. I'm not trying to make things complicated. I just want to know what is the best outcome for this. It, is it harmful? Like, is there is there some kind of loss in having a policy that says this? Because then, when it comes up in all these different formats, we've got something to point to. It's a couple of thoughts. It doesn't really come up often at all. It's come up twice in 14 years. Okay. Um, and I understand the getting to yes because we would like love to tell this person that they can participate. Um, our recommendation is clear. We've checked in with our attorneys. They're not recommending it. I believe we canvass communities. Amesbury, Beverly, Georgetown are no's. Ipswich is no. Rockport is no. Hamilton, Wenham, and Marblehead all no. Those are the people that replied. Also heard Bedford, Belmont, Concord, Broughton, Dunstable, Patfield, Littleton, and Kingsborough. No. Two communities have gotten recent requests. They have not given me any greater detail on the development. Them. So it, it does surface once in a great while. I think if we do, if the committee is very feeling very strongly that we need to pursue this as an expansion of our responsibilities, we're going to want to look at the authority of the school committee to admit students. Because essentially we're going to be admitting and expanding the scope of our involvement. So it's a it's a question to go back to our attorneys and just say, here's what we'd like to do. How do we get there? 
Oh, so I think I was asking a slightly different question. I, would, I don't think we need a policy because I think it's an accepted common practice and there's a comfortability at the administrative level of simply saying, no, sorry, we don't do this. Can I ask what the, the legal grounds were? I'm I'm sorry, sorry. <laughs> you're just having an exhaustive look coming. It's the same list of what sounds very negative. We understand that it sounds like very negative and, and defeatist, but it's everything from we're not certain that we would be insured for these students. Uh, students who participate in athletics have to have insurance, so our blanket insurance covers students who aren't in our care. How do you manage the students on a day to day basis? Um, how do you manage student discipline issues, access issues? Now, you know, we can write, do you write a very tight policy to say the, the children from this school or the, it, it's so it's a combination of it's expanding the scope of our work, expanding the scope of our responsibility, expanding the scope of our um, uh, student management domain, and we're in charge of in charge of water. So we don't have a policy or a school that we can point to that's doing this successfully. We'll continue to, I'm happy to continue to look, and if we can find a model to replicate, I just think we're in a situation where no one who is going to manage this on the day to day is recommended going forward. Can we take a vote? Let's oh, sorry. Um, the, the only, I have belabored this, so I'm just going to say this. Um, I understand what Pam is saying, and I, I keep going against what the administrative recommendation is, but the other thing that occurs to me is when we talk about it's happened twice in 14 years. I don't think that this is going to become the huge headache that it could become. I don't think we're talking about a very, very small number of students that might avail themselves of this. And I think that it will. Inclusivity, some of those benefits would counteract what I don't doubt would be an administrative headache, but I think it would be a very rare administrative headache. So that's why I continue to. That's my <laughs> Not the labor of the point is greater detail, but the first one was ended up being an OCR thing. And was vetted and the outcomes were determined through that. And it's a fairly public legal battle about access to after school activities in the school. And that's helpful information for this decision. In the other circumstances were very different in terms of the profile, but it yeah. No, nevertheless, that could be a situation we find ourselves in together. Any other Discussion or we're going to vote. Right. Do we need to all right? So the motion that's on the table is to repeat it again. Just take no action. Take no action on this request. Right. So by simple hook on the card and I think so. Uh those in favor? Take no action. Those against? All right. So the motion passes. Uh, was there also something on the reserves policy? Yes. Okay. Um, so I don't know if you all have a chance to look at a reserve policy. I think the last time we presented it, we just did a general discussion about some of the boring, <laughs> some of the key <laughs> items. Um, to make sure everybody feel comfortable. And if you have any other questions, we can always go back to the policy to edit it more or whatnot. And right now, this is just a trap. So to highlight a few things on the policy for you guys to decide is the percentage of the 8% of the total reserve. Um, again, to define the reserve is the stabilization uh, uh, pool account. And also the EMD. EMD, yes. <laughs> and EMD by law, that we cannot be more than 5%. Uh, but I think together, between the two four, uh, 8%. That's the recommendation. Uh, another thing that is struggling on the reserve is to have um, the stabilization to be used mostly for capital expenses. But with the school company's approval, uh, we could put it back to the operation budget. Okay. Anything else? Uh, one one question on the eight percent. Right now, it's drafted as a target. However, you want to interpret that question uh, came up, and and Michelle actually uh, 
may have a few things to say about this too. Should we put a minimum there and treat the 8% as a maximum? Right? There's different reasons for having minimums and maximums, both for you know uh, protecting our credit rating on the minimum side and for town relations on the maximum side, uh, you know, with the caveats of how we can use it as a draft. So point for discussion that would be helpful to finish this finish this circle. Yeah. Um, so first, I just like to open this up to general discussion. Does yeah, have any and questions? just to be clear, we're not requesting a vote on this at all. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, any specific questions around this? Or? I did have some questions. Uh, where did the eight percent come from? What was the basis for that? Uh, I do believe that it it would be helpful to have a lower as well as a higher bound. Um, and then my other question was, in this definition of ENP, do we need that in the policy if that's already Massachusetts general law? I can answer the 80%. Uh, the 80% uh, was uh, to be consistent with our town's interest of town. Now it is uh, how do we got the 80%. Originally about 10%, now it's 8%. And the reason they continue to be in the case, um, both towns get the 8% of their budget goes into the school district. So, what was that six? Uh, A6, I think it was still 10%, right? I believe it's still right. Yeah. But part of, part of the conversation that has been going on is to what extent can we rely on towns when there is an emergency that we need? More money than we have, right? So that that's where the. I don't think anybody's recommending going above ten percent. You know, no, there's no kind of uh, so benchmark for that. But the eight percent recognizes that um, is an attempt to recognize that you know the the money that sits in our reserve account ultimately came from the town, and um, you know we. If something happens where we need more than we have, or that we can't spend on any particular emergency, that we have the fallback of going to the towns directly. And the END should it be the language? Would be somebody a state law? Maybe ten. Michelle. Of course, we don't think it hurts. It also exists in the transfer policy language, so we can educate that way. I have the same reaction that it seemed to be redundant and um, potentially uh, as a lawyer, I never like to see the same definitions repeated in different documents because it can cause confusion at times. However, I think as long as it's repeated accurately, there is some benefit from a new school committee being able to look at the policy, see everything in one place and understand that this is what we're doing and this is where it comes from. So that's how we can do that. That we did discuss. The other thing this does, just to be explicit about it again, is this defines what we consider reserve accounts, which is a change from our past practice, where we were using yearly revolving accounts as a reserve account, and we are no longer doing that through this policy. This would just be the true reserve accounts, E and D, general stabilization. Excluding school, uh, school choice and the facility rental accounts. Uh, All right. Teresa. Um, I'm going to send my full comments by email because I think that'll be more effective and efficient. Um, I do like the idea of de defining in here clearly what we're talking about when we talk about reserves because that's something that has been continually difficult for people to, to grasp. Um, what I'm missing is the background for where this came from that we just haven't really had a conversation about. Um, I, I hear that Manchester's targeting eight, but Essex is still at 10. And if you look at what their actual reserve balances are, I'm interested to know where both our town partners stand on their balances versus their target and how that historically looks before we commit to saying something in line with what they're saying should be their target right now. Um, I'm also interested in having a conversation at the committee level about whether or not we need a um, defined uh, cap 
at all or, or target in that way where we have the state statute. Um, I, I'm interested in Michelle's input on this. I'm not going to put you on the spot at the moment, but I. I would like to know where the structure for this came from. Like, did it start from the MASC, you know, from, a, from an MASC draft um, policy that we then adapted for our needs or, or how that came to be? Those are things that would help me. You don't have to respond to them right now, and I'll send my, my full comments in. But I do want to understand a little bit more. Thank you, Kelly. In the interest of you know moving forward, we should respond to some of that. Um, I can say the structure of this came from a little bit of a number of different reserve policies. Um, Michelle also did give us some of the feedback you're asking for. She gave us and gave us input and talk about this. She's obviously seen other reserve policies. Um, so what were the answer? Were they like other school districts? The other school. So that's the kind of information I'm interested in here and what I wanted. Do you know what I mean? Like what the same kind of questions that you'll ask when someone brings something up with what school districts did we look at and that sort of thing. You don't have to answer it all right now. That's well, you're also gonna be on policy committee. Well, right. I, that's why that's why we can we can shorten this right up if you like. I have access to the folder and yes, the copy of all this. Why do I feel like I'm gonna have the exact same thing? Yes. I feel like I'm gonna go through here too about I think what I'm hearing is this is your this is irrelevant because what you don't have is a common philosophy of what you want to accomplish. Thank so you. I would recommend not continuing pushing it back to your policy subcommittee because the committee's done what it's supposed to do. It's turned over rocks, it's asked questions, we've debated. People have been really good at like somebody writes something, somebody trims it down. And it's been a really positive give and take on it. But what we don't have is everybody at the table or a consensus around the philosophy. So I would throw the policy writing aside and get to what are you, what are, what's, what are you trying to accomplish with the goal? What are the goals for the policy? We even have a, we started a year and a half ago with goals for the policy. Yes. But this group needs to get on the same page. Right. We don't need to send somebody up to write. We're in that writing agency part. part. Right. But I, I think what Pam's saying, I mean, totally agree. Um, is that that the conversation needs to happen here? So tabling yeah. it and doing it at subcommittee level doesn't make any sense. No, because we have. I I do. I have to reiterate what Kim said. We have looked at a lot of things. We have really tried to answer I thought the questions that this committee was asking. So if if we haven't done it, uh, then then let's tackle it. Like, let's talk about rather than you said you were going to sign comments. Let's not like. What are, what are the concerns that you think are not addressed in here that we should be addressing? I would like to know what at what lower boundary would we be alarmed? What lower boundary should cause an alarm? If it's too low, you're talking about the minimum. I mean, I'll, I'll say first, I think it's important that we put a minimum in here. Um, not only to, because the whole, the whole, to Pam's point, the whole purpose of us going down this road was so that we could say, you know, our policy is X, so we can't, in this particular year with these numbers in our reserve account, we can or cannot commit to putting money into our operation to cover the town, right? And we need a minimum to do that, right? A, a target doesn't give you that. A target, you know, basically says, we want to be around there for various reasons, but a minimum actually says, you know what, we're approaching that minimum and next year, if the town's asking us to contribute more in, you know, for operating, we're going to put ourselves below that minimum and we have now something we can point to to say, no, we really can't do that. It's going to harm us if we do that for credit ratings, for future emergency situations, right? All those reasons. So I think a minimum is important. And if we do that, then essentially the, the eight percent becomes the maximum upper bound, right? And if if that's if we treat it as a true maximum, then anytime we go above eight percent, we're essentially committing to putting that extra money into our operating the next year. So that, I guess that just like, but that doesn't answer the question of what is that? Lower what is the minimum? I personally. If I choose, I wouldn't choose a minimum. I would actually say uh, to just have it at eight percent. But if, if we have to choose a minimum, like the worst case scenario, I would say at least five percent. 
So if we can find the page. Well, at this point, it's starting to become more um, a discussion where we should probably make a motion. So since we're not going to make a motion tonight, unless there's specific just questions around what the work done has been, or what so I think we can move on. There's any questions. Not right. Um, I'm not. I'm not going to ask all my questions. Yeah, you're going to email. This is getting beyond the subcommittee report in it, but yeah. I wanted feedback. I'm glad to email my feedback. But I guess my my only remaining question is, what is the best move forward then? Because Pam put it into words. What I'm get. What I've been trying to get it is, what I what my hope was along the way is to have these discussions during like the reports as we're going. Like, okay, this is what we've looked at, and this is the thing we all need to decide for directionality, and then take the next step of of doing that thing together. But we, we haven't, it just hasn't come together in that way. So do but, workshop. Do our we, intent is this is what the conversation, this is exactly what this is supposed to accomplish. Okay. What you just said. Okay, so then I, I would suggest well, we meet at time. I'm a committee this. member, I'd say no 8%. Yeah. No, 10%, 10%. I'm role playing. Yeah. So give that specific feedback and see if we can't take another crack at it. Um, a minimum. It's important. It's not important. Maybe even take a straw poll. Um, there was language just used again. I'm not nitpicking or trying to be difficult, but does in excess of eight percent mean it goes back to operating, or do we look for to our capital needs and advanced projects? I know we're spending a lot of time on capital issues at the end of the year, so I think getting to understanding what the language means to the individual and then running through clarifications is important. I don't think you need to rush to get it. I know we haven't rushed, but we also haven't been dormant. It just it's, it's difficult because it's trying to do a lot of things for a lot of people. And maybe start with those three questions and then send the group back. For another edit. Or say, this is going to be 1 hour of time on August 6th. We're going to workshop it. We'll cost out the chart paper and. Try to get to some type of. Content commitments and then worry about how, whether we include the definition and how it gets shaped later. Those would be two potential opportunities, potential paths. Well, that was a great report. <laughs> I think we should, in the interest of time, move on to the superintendent's and the beer goals in general. Um, we're going to talk about the DF, the dip goals at the end. Is there any objection to moving mine to the end and getting the principles? Not at all. Doing the handbooks. So continued business. Uh, and book elementary and secondary and book updates. Do you guys need anything, John, or? At least at the elementary level, we can just kind of explain. Um, it's, been a, it's, it's been a number of years since we um, recommended changes to the handbook. Um, our um, the changes that we're recommending really are around um, attendance policies. Um, so there's a nationwide trend uh, post COVID uh, of chronic, chronic absenteeism across the country. Um, and so DESE's response to that um, has been to um, put, a, put a greater focus on in our accountability formula. Um, so they talk about chronic absenteeism um, as, as being absent from school for greater than 10% of the school year. So in a 180 day school year, that's 18 days. Um, and uh, we had in the handbook previously was there were different categories of absences that were uh, quote unquote excused. Um, and so kind of at the school level, we were able to excuse certain absences of sickness, um, that sort of thing. Um, DESE now kind of treats all absences equally. Um, I think their thinking is it doesn't really matter why you're absent, you're absent, so you must have been a school. Um, so uh, it, it kind of it caused a lot of awkward conversations with families this year as we were kind of trying to pivot um, at, at the four schools. Um, you know, we're trying to pivot to this new kind of way of looking at absenteeism, uh, communicating with parents and families um, when students hit certain thresholds to try to avoid that 18 day mark. Um, and, you know, you'd, I'd call a parent and we'd have a conversation about the absence, you know, the, the absence, absences, and they would say, oh, but, you know, they were sick and 
Um, it was actually interesting, uh, some of the different anecdotes that, that we've got um, from families with you know, a particular student who had you know, this school year, strep, COVID, um, you know, uh, surgery, you know, um, most of them were very legit uh, under our old policy of excused versus unexcused. So we wanted to kind of shift things from excused and unexcused in light of that um, to documented or undocumented. Um, the, the high school um, might be a little more in depth, but just uh, at the elementary level, uh, you know, so, so basically what we're looking at is um, documented absences would be medical, uh, bereavement, religious, um, and then we actually do have in all of the handbooks um, college visits or post secondary um, activities, um, which is really just at the high school level. Um, so those would be things that we would consider documented absences. They're still not excused because uh, uh, when it flows up to Desi, um, uh, it's not excused in terms of our accountability format. Um, the conversations have been really helpful um, with families. A lot of families have said, oh my gosh, I didn't realize that we're um, we don't have that number already. Um, um, you know, I see what, what, what Desi's trying to do theoretically in practice. Um, it is, you know, I have had some families who have called me um, you know, seven o'clock in the morning. We just talked the other day. I know she's at 17 days, but she is at home vomiting. Um, I'm going to send her in unless you tell me not to. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's kind of that's kind of been the message. And so that that's really the change is just in the terminology. There's a little more of an explanation of what chronic absenteeism is, you know, 10 percent, um, and then just the different terminology of documented uh, versus undocumented. Um, and just a little more kind of explanation of, of um, state law. Um, that, that was um, that was we said we added for the team. So I'm not sure if there's any difference in high school or maybe it's the same. It's just, I mean, very similar in the whole reason behind it. It's the same, but we have we have the additional kind of confusion of excused and unexcused, which was necessarily documented or undocumented. So it was a little bit more confusing and we together cleaned up the language um, along with we had Heather's help as well. So we were all on the same page about it about that. So the same language kind of changed for us too. So instead of having those different formulas of this is document, this is excused, it's just all kind of falling into the same category. And we do we did add something in there. So it's instead of just college visit, we'll put a slash there and put post secondary activity. So we can make sure we're accounting for all of our students who are looking into something to do after graduation. The process was helpful for us to align our practice and to align our coding and ASPEN just to streamline it a little bit more. Um, from a middle school perspective, I know you had a question about the change in the um, response to tardies at the six party students who have received attention. And having put that into practice this year, we're finding um, that it really needs to be addressed on a case by case basis. Um, for all families, the punitive approach isn't necessarily effective. Uh, more of a relationship based approach is really what will make more of a difference. And in some cases, it's not the student who's responsible for the tardiness. So we don't want to we don't want to punish the student for something that's out of their control. So we're, we'd like to change it so that our new dean uh, next year, Joe Janak, has meetings with students, builds those relationships, builds with relationships with parents, makes those connections and um, Approach from that angle. That's not to say we won't still issue uh, a consequence, but that won't happen as a blanket response for all parties. And I think that that change, sort of the change we made in the handbook language, really aligned with the Department of Ed's guidances around that collaboration with families. Like it takes families to work with kids on getting to school. Um, so just being able to change both like the middle school piece and just all of our handbooks in general to focus more on working collaboratively collaboratively with families in order to increase student attendance. Yeah. Same thing at the high school that we do have our tardy policy. Um, Liz Drinkbar does an amazing job talking to our chronically tardy students and the whole point of kind of outlining all this is to build the relationship. So when the phone call comes home, it's not the phone call is coming home and now you're receiving this punishment. The phone call is always, this is what we're noticing. We want you here. We notice when you're not here. What do we do? What can we do to help you get into school? And the same thing, we take everything on a case by case basis and 
one thing we have learned over the years is, you know, if someone is chronic and tardy, giving them attention doesn't fix the problem. It's, mm -hmm. If it was magical, then we would, it would be very easy to solve. So mm -hmm. it's, it's more nuanced than that. So it's difficult to put in a tardy policy, but obviously we're talking about human beings and we're talking about having building relationships, but to start out with here and just know that when the phone calls do come forward, it's because we're trying to build a relationship and help you with something so that it give you what you need so that the student can come to school and we can solve the issue. And then just the other piece that's important is uh, prior to, uh, to COVID, you had um, absence letters that would go home to families when they hit certain thresholds and then during COVID, obviously we paused that. Um, so we, we've restarted that this year. So um, a letter goes home at five, 10, 15, and 18 absences, and they're kind of progressive um, to let people know that this is where you are and as you get closer to the the 18, um, it just kind of it talks about all of the things that we're just talking about with and TSM and um, accountability formula and that sort of thing. Um, so those we started setting in the middle of the year. We had some tech issues that we were working through. So I, I really think starting those in the beginning of the year would be really helpful. You know, when people get the problem, um, it's like, oh, okay, you know, you need to pay attention to that. So kind of listen, you know. any questions for us? Uh, I had one question just about the high school because it, it wasn't clear to me. Did the tardiness policy change the same way the middle school did so that it's no longer three tardies add up to a detention? It's not three tardies that add up to a detention. I believe it's five tardies. Mr. Lawrence, you could change it to five. Yes. And again, that will be something that. That's something that that is both those reports and usually when a student gets to be around three, we start having conversations with that. So we don't we can try to not get to that. <laughs> can I yeah. Can I say that? yeah. Uh, I'm gonna just share that I, I received this question um surprisingly as a school committee member, and I'll just share some feedback. I've gotten some parents, and I trust that you guys are dealing with all sorts of parents, but some parents loved the concept. Some parents are trying so hard to get those kids out of the door. So having a, an automatic and known consequence at three was was helpful. Mm -hmm. And it, and now understanding that the reason I was getting this question was, wait, is school not actually doing that because my kid isn't getting the consequence that I keep threatening that that's happening yet. <laughs> yeah. um, so I think uh, I just think it's it's food for thought because I'm sure that for some families we do have to be treating you know recognizing individual situations. Yeah. For others, there are families that, that really love that black and white. So, right. just yeah. sharing, yeah. sharing that thought. For the, right. But yeah. that's yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 for the detention. They were looking for that, like, yeah. you know, yeah. and we had detention this afternoon. So, yeah. so, yeah. so there was, it did have, even in June, we have detention. I don't know, good, bad, or different. I should be proud of that. But <laughs> there was detention for charity this afternoon. <laughs> um, are we just discussing attendance or are we talking about the other? Uh, so, that, so elementary, that's those are our changes. So. And then I have a question about elementary attendance. <laughs> um, the language in the middle school, I think. I just level check. Sorry. Yeah, the language in the middle school absence responsibilities is. Almost identical to the elementary school one, and I was. It made me feel stressed out as an elementary school parent. Now I only have an upper elementary school parent, but if my child were say in second grade and I was reading, and after they've been out sick for a week with COVID or something, that um, students are expected to confer with teachers and establish a mutually acceptable time frame for the completion of missed assignments, classwork, and tests. That I would be having like heart palpitations at home <laughs> if I thought that I was going to have to make up a week of second grade at home with my kid. Yeah. Can you just speak to that? <laughs> yeah. Obviously, it's uh, developmentally dependent. Um, and so, second grade teacher would work with the parent. To kind of identify what the kind of must do's are. Um, obviously, trip at high school where you know, there are certain assignments that have to be turned in, in for grade. So, I know they usually kind of massage that um, into what's reasonable and, and necessary. So, I, I think one of my points was on that same point. 
I felt there was a lot, there was confusion in all of them about when a parent should confer with teachers. Mm -hmm. And I think elementary is certainly one of the triggers for me, but even at, even at high school, like, and the language is, you know, at least when I first read it, you know, one was like, don't ask the teacher before you go. And then the other one was like, you know, if it's unanticipated, then you can ask, right? So I think maybe just clarifying the language a little bit about when parents yeah. should confer yeah. or students should confer. And what role does, um, you know, Google Classroom play in that now where you know, parents and kids can check right. whatever they want, right? So it doesn't have to be on the teacher person. Right. So when we talked about the, the confusion there, like it says teachers are not required to provide schoolwork in advance of planned absence. That was the paragraph referring to like people, students who are going on vacation and students who are going to there anticipate I'm going to be up next week. And that sentence is in there just, you know, because. If I'm going to, you know, I'm going to be out the week before I'm vacation, what do I, what do I need to do? I'm going to do it now. And I think we were, that sentence is in there in response to teachers getting bombarded with stuff. I can't, I don't know what I'm doing in two weeks yet. So the planned absences is where that language is in there. We're not required to provide, to provide it in advance. Um, but then the unanticipated absences, like it says, it's kind of, it kind of is a contradiction, but that. That sentence was in the paragraph of when you are intending to be out for an extended period of time. We can't expect the teacher to just give you the work ahead of time. Um, and then I forget the second part of your question, but oh, with Google Classroom, you know, it's always a good idea for students to check Google Classroom, but especially in high school, not everything's on there, which I'm glad about because I don't want my students to be able to make up a course with a piece of paper. I want it to be, you have, you know, we need to make this lab up, we need to have a discussion or it needs to be something further, but it is always an idea to teachers when they are, you know, to check Google Classroom, Google Classroom to see what they can do. But we didn't have it in there because again, not everything is on there. It's tangible and can be done there. They mean it, they need to appear activity or we just had students here tonight for their civic action project. Uh -huh. They need to do some things that aren't just online to do their work. All right, so I'm always, I'm, I'm... If you can clarify any of that in any way, that'd be okay. Yep. I think you know what we're saying makes a lot of sense. It doesn't come across. Okay, that's so good to know. Feedback from this group: Should we just be as direct as to say, vacations will not be. People planning on vacations should not anticipate work ahead of time. Yeah. Yes. If that's your reason for it, yeah. Yes. Yes. Right now, yes. Yes. we don't support the vacation. But I also I feel I really struggle with this because. Um, as a parent of a child who has been chronically absent um, from COVID, from the stomach bug, from broken bones, like for completely legitimate reasons, um, my expectation or my hope was that he would be able to complete score now. That there should be some minimum standard of work that can be done at home mm -hmm. to minimize the learning loss during an extended absence. Um, and I wonder if in the post COVID world, we are going to be living in this space where there are more absences in general, where people are being more careful about cold symptoms, where people are being more careful about um, immunodeficient family members. And so if that is just like an unavoidable fact, what can we do to support our students in minimizing that learning loss while they're out? That's where Google Classroom will come into play. So I think at Jake's request too, we could put language in there about referring to Google Classroom, but also connecting with the teacher on assignments that may not be linked to that and making a plan for that in a realistic way over time and not overloading the student when they get back. Right. I think we can, I think I'd be able to for sure. I'm guessing the other level we can have some, you know, language about extended medical access and the medical tests. I remember my brother bringing on that packet when I was sick. Yeah. Your teacher sent this one. Yeah. 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 That, that is the, that is the practice. Yeah. We just, we don't have it. And, and, and it's kind of a fine line uh, because a lot of things that you're describing are what Jesse is trying to move society away from. Right. You know, um, I actually was talking to one parent. She said, oh, she's, you know, if he, if he has even like a little sniffle, we keep him home because we don't want to get anybody else sick. And I don't know. It's like, it's a fever, it's vomiting, and that's, that's the sickness uh, threshold. So, um, but we can certainly add some things to that. If, you know, so. 
like you were saying, with that extended medical absence, you know, COVID, whatever. I, I do think we are trying to do two things with all of this. One is communicate that there's a relationship between the school and the parents and what we may accept and know locally or through our relationship with your family and totally get and support where you're at is all well and good, but the state doesn't recognize it and we're and we're <laughs> the state doesn't care we're putting the money toward our detention, which is going to be knocks on accountability, right? Because they're going to count those days whether or not it's the most legitimate, understood crazy series of events in a school year, it's still going to rack up as we're not getting this to school. So I think it is trying to do exactly what John said and, and we must tell you about it all. I was going to say, the fall will be back for some uh, accountability data. So we have, to <laughs> I have one minor thing I wanted to add, and this is just in terms of like, in general, I think we're all better off if people read the sound books. And I'm very sorry to say I don't copy sound books very often, or at least in, in the world I'm familiar with. And one thing I think that can sometimes um, discourage families from reading it is when it feels like it doesn't apply to them. And so when I was um, reading the elementary school one and I saw the example of college visits, yeah. it struck me as obviously not a problem that you have it there, but it struck me that maybe that is the type of thing that uh, causes families to inadvertently tune out and say, this isn't really about me. So um, unless there's some reason for- We're being recruited. <laughs> <laughs> unless there's a reason for like Desi standards that you have to have that language, maybe just, you know, striking that yeah. provision would help people feel more like they're talking to me. And I'm I'm just, yeah. I think that, we're trying to just be a unit, like be aligned uh, and be together in that when the language is the same, when you get to right. the middle high school, you're not seeing just right. different language, but that makes complete sense. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 there's, there's never, never that deal too, but that was. My input is just that uh, I'm sad to hear that this is the way it is now, because one of the beauties of having a small district is that people know each other, they understand each other, and that we don't have to do it to a number. Mm -hmm. And um, so, I guess my input is thank you for being willing to take the input on from all of us on this and also being mindful of may versus will mm -hmm. in terms of the detentions and that sort of thing because there's a lot of value to um to the there's been value to my family when we have chosen to do a thing like a vacation as a family at this time and to have the support of the people there who are doing it four times a year different story but but just to be able to have that um, that relationship makes a huge difference, and that's what, part of what makes our district special. So thank you for finding balance with that. We turn to the gun. So is this something that we are voting on tonight, or is this something that at this point needs to? It's a technicality that typically actually the handbooks are approved at the school level, but we have had the practice of bringing them in the for school committee approval to get to all be on the same page. That's yeah, so how about? Uh, I'll make a motion that we can book uh, and respectfully request that some of our input may be added to. Uh, Can I have my my, my uh, academic integrity definition first if I change that before you approve it? Sure. <laughs> sure. I'm just really proud of this because this was a school council thing. So yeah. I had additional changes with just language and dates and things, but in the progressive discipline chart, just kind of on the same page of making connections, but the school council tackled the um, the task of coming up with the definition for academic integrity. And we, we noticed that in that plagiarism section, it just goes straight to punishment. And this is what's gonna happen when we catch you. And I, we kind of had the conversation of well, what does that even mean, academic integrity? So we came up with a definition that was with school council. So we had students, we had teachers, we had community members and parents all working together on that definition. and. We brought it to the teachers and we're adding it in there. And I think what we're trying to do is not change all the handbook language, but just change the the change the narrative of we're not, it's not about being punished or being punitive. Like this is what we expect of you. We should be able to define it, especially when we're talking about vision of a graduate. We should be able to define what it looks like to be someone with academic integrity. Here's what we expect of you. Here, here is what's, you know, if if we've just if you've not been practicing academic integrity. This is what, if we use the word may, this is what may happen. But I was really proud of that. And I wanted to give a shout out to school council as well. 
And the same thing with our progressive discipline. There was just a lot of change to be more about what does the student need and more about conversations, bringing in the teachers, having more conversations at an early level so that things don't escalate to further that you know, up to a higher level. And we're hoping that this will just foster a lot more conversation amongst other stakeholders and parents and just bring everyone in early. But I just wanted to say our academic integrity definition was I love it. <laughs> can I make one? Can I just sorry? I know that we're beating the horse now. I'm just going to follow up on Erica's comment about the college visits and suggest I don't know if this is straight from Desi, but suggest that um, school visits might be relevant at all levels. And so if there is an eighth grader who's visiting, a, who's shadowing at a boarding school for a day, or a third grader who is moving out of district and they're going to go visit their new district school for a day, but those are relevant and um, similar in nature. So there might be space for wording there that would be more inclusive. In terms of documents. Yeah, right. Document, yeah. Yeah, like, yeah. Maybe yeah. Sure. the fact yeah. that my visits will visit the fact that for the Good sure. Yeah. Good <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, sure. no um, so you guys got the intent of that, which is there a second? Second. Any discussion? I don't think I've already done it. All right, just show of hands, those who break any notes. Perfect. Thank, Thank you, you Paul. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Yeah. Thank you for your time. Okay, uh, so next on the agenda is uh, NFY24 budget item. Uh, so, spring budget to actuals transfers. So, that's you, Michelle. So, this was sent out late in the packet, and I do apologize. This is one of the casualties of a, a mid year start trying to figure out what was done before. Um, so, made it a little complicated. But basically, we have our year to date budget report through May 15th. Um, at that point, we were 76 spent in our operating budget overall, and we we're 86% through the year. So I just wanted to mention, you know, for you as well as feeling um, our largest payroll comes up as of the last day of school, which is equivalent to basically two months of the teacher's payroll. So therefore, that skews the percentages all throughout the entire year. Um, so we do account for that, and that is in the column that's called additional expected or additional projected expense. So all those payrolls are in there along with all of the other expenses that we're anticipating. Um, so we look at that projection. Um, one thing I did want to mention, which is a, typically a volatile cost throughout the years, are out of district tuition costs. This year, I know that Avi had mentioned earlier on the year in his, his projection in the fall that it was over budget where we had anticipated for the year. Um, this year, overall, it looks like we were about 300,000 over our budget. We did get a one time circuit breaker reimbursement. They had a program for um, additional reserve, which was 239,000, which absorbed most of that cost, and 61,000 we will be able to fund ourselves. Corresponding expense with the out of district tuition costs is the transportation costs. Since COVID, transportation costs have just skyrocketed. Um, something that might have cost us a couple hundred thousand a few years ago is now costing us close to a million or they own. They're own. So our out of district tuition, I mean, our out of district transportation costs are about $150,000 over. Um, I'm sorry, that's $52,000 over. Um, we are anticipating we'll be able to make a prepayment of our out of district tuition costs, which is something we've historically done for many years. Um, projected that to be at least 150,000 next year, so for next year, to offset those costs. So that's a little bit of an insurance policy, which will give us a little bit of a buffer for next year. So when all that is said and done, we take a look at our major categories. Um, our personnel side of the budget is in the yellow box. Our expense side is in the green box. And so basically we are needing to finish the year taking about 66,000 from our personnel side and transferring that to our expense side. And some of these, this does include the prepayment. It does 
consider some of our year end capital items and some of our technology purchases. So we're just trying to plan the best we can with what we have left, which isn't a lot, um, but to do the best we can with it. So we are asking that you um, make a motion to approve the transfers totaling $66,000. So, are there any questions? Please let me know. First, uh, let's make that motion and then we can discuss. So, I will make a motion to approve a transfer in the amount of $66,000 from the personnel side of the budget to the operating expense side of the budget for the detailed categories listed in the budget to actual report. Okay. <laughs> and I'll second. You guys might benefit from this. And I'll second. Uh, so, any discussion? I really like this format. Thank you. It's easy to digest. This is all standard. Yes, this is what we do every yeah. um, It's just recommendation. Um, so I think, sorry, I think this is my don't yes. um, The 76% of the operating budget is spent so far. I think what might be helpful is to also compare to last year's year to date. So we can see, because it's hard to compare the 86% and 76. So compared to last year, they will help. Um, and the out of district expense of the additional 212 transfer, is that normal to pay the following year in the current year? Yes. Okay. Yeah, we have done that each year. Um, and then in the transfer, of the budget request, we still have a negative 400,000 from school choice fund. But school choice fund, because we are supporting or fronting the, the field, right now school choice is down to close to zero, right? So how would the negative 400K impact that? The 400,000 was voted in the FY24 budget, so the year we're currently in, and that was to offset the health insurance costs. We did the same thing in the FY25 budget as well. And that has been taken. The FY24 has been taken care of this year. The FY25 money will come from the FY25 revenues. So, it came from the current year revenues. We did spend it down, but that was prior to the, this year's revenues. Okay. It might help. We get school choice payments on a monthly basis. Yes. So, that's the revolving nature of it. So, we're getting compensated for it. So, even though the past well, Michelle said the cost balance was drawn down. We continue to receive payments beginning at the beginning of the fiscal year. Yes. Any other questions or comments? All right, then we'll take a vote. Uh, all in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. <laughs> Next on. Um, the agenda is the OBED Trust uh, Annual District Contribution. It's a competition. <laughs> Not a competition. Yeah. Bring them in. <laughs> so, so uh, not sure if Pam wanted to speak to this. Me too. Um, we can tag team. How about that? So, this is a follow up to the presentation, to the work that um, John first did on our behalf to. Um, work with town. This is the Highland Field advertised. We're on Open. We're on an moped. I'm excited about Highland. Um, switched up. This is just our annual OPEP contribution. We're a little early. Sometimes we're not doing this until the summer. I haven't had a chance to clean things up, but we were ready to go this year. So this is similar to what we're just saying about school choice. This is what we book in the budget as our annual contribution, which will never. It would be a miracle if it's ever exact to what's in the line item in the budget because we have a formula that exists in the contract um, that works to determine the actual payment based upon any savings from. We go back to the time in which we uh, implemented OPEP, and there's a formula that follows the savings we would. It's a savings based on what we had versus what we transferred to to achieve OPEP savings. And it's very complicated, but that's how we derive the number. So Michelle worked the formula, I do not. Um, and this is just the memorialization of the, um, the transfer. I was impressed by the polls. If the polls. Absolutely impressive. 
I don't know if I captured. There's no simple way to capture it, but there was a no. long-term assessment of what would have been. Yes. Exactly. So do we have a motion to approve? Move to approve the OPEP contribution. Oh, does this go to mass print? Yes. yes. I can't. I, I actually have to abstain. Sorry. My husband is a financial advisor at mass print, so okay. um, sorry, I can't make motion. Motion to approve. <laughs> motion to approve a transfer in the amount of six hundred and five thousand three hundred and twenty seven dollars from the operating budget to the OPEP trust fund. Yes, sir. So any discussion. Just to confirm that's basically the number we put in our budget. Yes. A good thing to do. So all in favor. Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, motion passes. Thank you. Next on the agenda is the Highland Field Advertising <laughs> Rate Schedule. So this is the follow up <laughs> to the good work that Donna first did, um, and then Cammy's follow up to prepare to begin selling advertising for the spring, uh, for the fall. Um, so these are the proposed fee options, and uh, typically all fee setting of fee comes to setting of fees because it's worth waiting for. Um, we do an approval. So this is the proposal. We shall work on the finances with. So, yes, we have any comments. Yeah, Cami and Aaron did survey of all our, our neighboring communities, districts, um, to find out what they're charging, and this seemed to be very comparable. Um, this will allow for lots of great one time non referring costs, as such as improvements and capital nature in the athletics realm. Um, and will also go into the revolving. So, basically, the, the one, one season structure of $650 and the full, full year of two seasons of $1,050. So, they requested. So, uh, someone can make a motion. Can I, can I ask a clarifying question before we do that? Is there? Of course. It's my understanding when we accepted that uh, request was that we were charging the policy committee to work through the policy before we took much more action. Just want to clarify what we actually voted because part of that vote literally said. We charge the policy with looking. We charge the policy subcommittee with looking at the policy for advertising. I don't know that that was a part of the vote. The I, vote I went, was actually went, presented, it, but you went. Yeah, but I went back, and it, it says it in the motion. And I know we've been waiting. You know, what, we went, we waited until the town took its vote, and so we haven't had time to work on it since. But um, it's been on our list to look at the policy because we have a policy to accept. Advertising or not, we have no policy to manage it. Right? For example, who you know, do we do we exclude anybody? Right? If certain companies of certain types right. wanted to advertise, do we say no? Who gets discounts and under what conditions? Where does the money go? Right? There's a, there's a whole and maybe the policy is that the administration should develop it, but it feels like there should be a management plan for this, right? Rather than just who you know, do, does does staff go out and actively solicit? Right, or are they waiting for, you know, if the booster goes out and solicits and somebody complains, what happens, right? There's all kinds of situations that feel like should be thought through before we're out asking for money or collecting money. So I think for this particular vote, I think it would be fine for us to approve this and that would take care of uh, or you know, supersede any need for a policy. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't still look at a policy, but that also, in my opinion, would not mean that we need to not take a vote on this today. Uh, so, something to consider. Um, you know, again, and as you mentioned, Blake, right? It, you know, maybe it needs to be a policy, maybe it doesn't. Uh, but I think at this point, we should be able to, in the In terms of uh, being able to accomplish uh, the intent of this for the fall season, I think we should take a vote on this now. If it's something that we even need to take a vote on, or it's simply it's setting the rate, setting, yeah, setting, just setting the rate, right? Right, but do we even need to 
take a vote on that necessarily? Or is this more like a vote of confidence? No, we need to vote. We want to vote. Okay. Definitely want to vote on the rates. And then we can talk about the policy concept. So I'd say vote on the, the rates and then we can talk about maybe next step. Next yeah. step. So I'll make a motion to approve ban visa $650 for a single season, $1,050 for two seasons, and the discounted rate of $100 per season for Manchester Essex Youth Sports Organizations. And I'll second that. So any discussion? I'll just say I'm going to vote against this because I think it's too early. I have nothing against the rates. I think the rates are fine. I just don't think we but should be out. I think it's too early for us to be posting this kind of information or to make a decision about this until we've got through, particularly the discount part of this and, and the other policies. Yep. Any other discussion or comments? Yeah. I agree with you. <laughs> so I think it was, I actually don't remember what the motion was last time when I approved it, but if the motion was to have a policy in place, I agree that we should set up some rules and boundaries before we move forward. Okay. So I just I pulled up the policy from um that. So if, if you're saying that the the motion we made included a specific charge, I think we'll want to re review that and, and see that. But the policy we currently do have in place says that no advertising of commercial products or services will be permitted in school buildings or on school grounds premises without permission of the school committee. Yep. So we effectively gave one time permission was what was what we voted on, wasn't it? As presented to give permission to do that thing. So so again my understanding was that we were charged with policies that would affect management of advertising once we accepted it. I don't remember that being the so, case. Does anyone remember the date? Yes. Yeah, this is uh, two twenty nine. Nope. This is March, February sixth. This is February sixth meeting. Okay. We voted on this. Maybe that was the date I looked. I found the notes in it. Okay. Yes. I think I'm it's checking the message so we now. Can I vote that the, the, we should continue with the vote on yeah. the construction trust in our administration that they're not going to be putting up logos for anything questionable at this point. And I feel like we need to work on a policy regarding that. We can do so. I don't think that it should preclude us from, from moving forward. Generating revenue. If it helps, I think this would run very similar to advertising in your books or playbills mm -hmm. in terms of what is and isn't accepted and how it is solicited. Just a general. And we don't have, we we've don't. never had a policy regarding that either. Yeah. Okay. I say that it's a good thing or a bad thing. It right. just, that's, that's how I would see this in being the same target group as. Those types of I agree that it's reasonable to move forward with this. So, to hear the fees and then to follow up and see whether or not that was the case. Because my my recollection is that we wanted to do that thing, but that we were approving this as a one time. Thing. You know what I mean? So, I want to make sure that we're on the same page with that. But I agree with Kate that um, the administration would be considered to figure out that. Thing. I agree as well. So we will take a vote unless there's any other comments. Yep. So uh first we'll see uh, uh raise hands to show who approves of the rate schedule. And as opposed. So that passes five to two. Next on the agenda is the district room plan and to be your update from Allison and Michelle. Oh. <laughs> uh, thank you for waiting. Oh, just, just do that. I can do that. I just don't want to care. Sorry. 
So we'll start with the district and switch to the Start. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. just I'm bringing it up. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a little slow. That's Don't put me in. Yeah. <laughs> this will, we will be tag teaming and everybody will have an opportunity to kind of speak to the pieces that they were um, running point on. Um, just starting with, of course, everything's, everything that we're reporting on tonight is based in um, the execution of the improvement plan, which is in support of the strategic improvement plan and our overall vision. Um, as a reminder, the district improvement plan isn't just our local wants and needs, um, but it, it also takes into account our federal and state responsibilities to so something like accountability uh, based on attendance, should we make its way into this. Um, in our ongoing student data collection and local needs assessment, as well as kind of the guiding force of the strategic plan. So this is just a little reminder of the structure and that we set the plans to inform not only the district work, but then try to create coordination between the school improvement plans and also the educator plans. Um, and I think living document is critical. So we're seeing some things you probably saw in our notes that things that seem to make a lot of sense two years ago aren't proving out to be to make as much sense to us now or seeing through our growth and learning that there are different ways of tackling the problem that are more in line with um, some of the things that we may be trying to achieve. So um, a living document in that I think we're continually tending to it and trying to address our stated objectives, but also being mindful that um, we may need to modify our approach as we go along. Um, so some things that popped on the list in terms of federal and state mandates that we are presently wrestling with and may not have been thinking about two years ago when we originally formed the plan um, is uh, uh, the tiered focus monitoring, and you're going to hear us for kind of repeat a couple of different things that are happening in terms of overall district evaluation and the tiered focus monitoring, or what used to be called the coordinated program review, which is our major compliance piece um, that uh, looks at all of our special education law as well as our, our titles like Title IX, um, Title V, and civil rights. That that type of oversight by DESE. Um, we, we are in the middle of that now. Um, our on site review will be next year. So, while we have our list of local to do's and wants, time will have to be allocated to addressing uh, those needs. You'll also see in my report that we did get, uh, we didn't have this when we were putting the, the slides together. We'll also be going through um, the district review process next year. We worked, uh, we did hear from the Department of Ed at the end of last week, and it was graduation day, that we have been. Um, asked to participate in the district wide review. So we will be learning more about that for the end of summer, but that will be another um, another piece that will take some time and attention from us. But I also think um, yield some good information as we begin to tee up our next three year district improvement plan. This will be in the third year next year. So between the tiered focus monitoring, um, the DESE district review, as well as the ongoing elementary NEAS accreditation process. We should have some really good inputs in terms of informing our next three years. And that's how those three year cycles are built. You'll see um, the, the chart and graph that you got um, that kind of shows what our focus areas were, the big one that kind of goes through and color codes where we are on things. You'll, if you recall, last year and this year are pretty heavy in deliverables with fewer in the third year, meaning the third year is kind of a catch up and round out some of the pieces that we've been working on and also be collecting data to inform what our next round will look like. Um, so HQIM is also something that's um, on the federal and state mandates list that we'll be working on, attendance accountability, uh, the Student Opportunity Act. Uh, you, you saw our plan and what's been filed there in the IEP improvement project. So I guess I'll ask at this point if Heather um, or Allison want to comment on um, their pieces of that puzzle or their 
about in the past. So if there's anything, you know, we're just kind of keeping it high level, what, what's important for the committee to know in terms of how this um, adds to our list of things to do and may draw down on things we want to be doing in terms of what we have to be doing to satisfy requirements. Do you want to go first? Sure. I, I would, my piece I would just say is honestly, a lot of what it does is it complements. Sometimes it, these additional processes take more time, but then they also give us a structure and a thoughtful way of going through it. So, you know, that continual improvement work, um, while these are going to take time and energy and effort, it also provides often a structure or an evaluation routine through which we can then look through some of these pieces so that, you know, they might be entering through a different lens, but, um, a lot of them are really going to help to continue for the work that is built into the strategic plan, at least from the, um, the curriculum instruction assessment lens. Um, and the two things that I'll comment on are the tiered focus monitoring and the IEP improvement project. So the tiered focus monitoring process is very much policy oriented. Are we in compliance? Are we following certain policies and procedures that DESE sets forth in these areas? And it involves a review of student files, a review of documents and policies that we have in place. And it has, DESE has actually dialed back on the, some of the special education uh, document policy review, but they do have us do an extensive review of student files in certain areas. The English language learners has been an extensive project and um, very time consuming for me over the last month or so. Um, but it is soon coming to an end and then Desi will visit um, and interview us about our submissions. And then with the IEP improvement project, we probably talked a little bit with you or Pam has before. Essentially, we have a new IEP format starting this year. I I agree with Jesse, like their goal is to make it more student centered, to have more opportunity to integrate parent feedback and vision. And I think they've done a nice job with that. We're looking forward to the form. We've done a lot of training around it. And um, it's under the larger umbrella of a strengths based approach and using um, and just looking at, at the way we structure learning environments to support all students. So it's um, we've done some universal design for learning training as a leadership team in line with this, and we will be rolling up next year. So that's been a big focus this year and, and will be next year as well. And I think we're aware. I didn't talk about this. Nope. I think something that's on. Um, our radar screen is just the direction that Destiny's going. The commissioner stepped down mid year. Um, we have an interim, who is, you know, seasoned and carrying on with the game plan that's there, but new leader, new direction, um, potential, or it could stay the same. So I guess it's a question mark for us. So we don't know if that will, what, if any impact that will have on what's asked of us at the district level. But we do know we're going to need to tackle the revised educator evaluation rubrics. And if you did take a peek at some of my notes on the goals that I had set to work on this year, we're beginning the preparations for that at the leadership level. So similar to how we started to prep, prep for um, cultural competency by getting our leadership team knowledgeable, up to date, and um, prepared to lead the work at their level, we started this year with work with the leadership team around um, spending more time in classrooms together as a team, starting to work together to develop common look fors. We'll carry that forward next year with a little bit more of an intensive um, observing and analyzing teaching set of sessions throughout the year in preparation for launching work on the new model. So it's a good time with our team to be doing that work, but also a good time to be hitting the reset button on how we do the work, how we calibrate the work, what we're looking for in classes, so that we're prepared to implement the new eval rubrics. The new eval rubrics have started to pull in a lot of the work around cultural competency and inclusion that's been going on um, at the state level and required at the state level. So uh, that will be a new, and the engagement, I think, is being emphasized going forward. So that's just kind of a vision of what's to come and what we're starting to think about as we prepare uh, for our next series of improvement goals. 
Um, so there's four major strategic initiatives. If you take them apart, you have three that are really focused on curriculum and instruction. Um, and one that tends to fo focus more our fourth one on operations. So we've divided them out for the purposes of our conversation tonight. Um, so, you know, we're working on establishing and fostering authentic uh, pre-K learning environment and also integrating social emotional learning into all aspects of the day and um, celebrating and nurturing an inclusive and diverse school culture. So. I think what you what you what we hope you saw in our layout of um, where we are in progress on some of our goals under these headers is that strategic initiative three had the highest success rate and the fewest deliverables. Two came in second, and one is the one that needs the most work. And if you think about where we were when we entered the district improvement plan, we were already midway in work on two and three, so they're starting to fade to fade to the back in terms of where we're grounded and we're implementing and we're expanding our reach and our teachers reach by using our leadership's learning to leverage growth at the school level. And you're starting to see authentic learning emerge into the fore as our primary work um, for the coming year. So we did see, I think you'll, you'll see in some of our notes, transitions played a little bit of a role from our perspective in our pace of being able to implement on some of, the, um, on some of our deliverables. But I do think we're making solid progress. I think our, our what are we, 78 percent completion on our deliverables in the second year, um, which should put us on target for complete for full completion by the end of next year. Our goal is 80. My goal was 80 for the year, so a little bit shy of that. But I still think um, a, a good effort and good progress to be made with good um, foundational work um, to take on completion next year. Um, most of these things. Anything on, on here that's jumping out to you guys that you wanted to comment on? Can I just summarize that? I don't want to read it. Summarize it well and we'll get into more detail. Okay. So just uh, very quickly, the overarching themes, curriculum review and development, supporting and transitions and community connection. So we, we sat down at the table and we said, okay, think about the, the year. What comes to mind is some of the common themes, and these were the ones that were on all of our list in terms of things that we found ourselves working on, um, speaking to, or managing through um, throughout the year. Um, so, Heather, do you want to give a little commentary on curriculum review and development? Yeah, I think a lot of these pieces, I think Pam said it really well, it became clear that the work was less like new learning and more how are we taking the learning that we've built with the system have done and then integrating it into practice. So, and that's a little harder to measure on sort of a deliverable, but it is something that is a pretty significant growth um, when you're when you're tackling new topics. So I think those pieces are definitely reflected in a lot of the curriculum review development. Um, and then some of the other pieces were some of the system shifts with literacy uh, adoption and implementation at the elementary level. And then that that restructuring of what does it look like when we're supporting um, students who might need some additional academic or um, behavioral social emotional support and the growth and the shift in that program that's taken place over the last three years has so all of these pieces right they become nested dolls that they support and interact with each other um, and, and I think that piece really came through as we're looking at um, the, the tangible pieces and some of the and those uh, focus areas of two and three um, so there's there's some really tangible technical pieces like the building of the MTSS mm -hmm. structure routines, but then also um, the less obvious pieces that are a little trickier to measure are moving towards that level of implementation and integration that has taken place. And it just kept coming up in my conversations um, in a celebratory way. Of, um, it's, it's exciting to come in and see and it, it, they keep hearing like, let me tell you where we were a few years ago from teachers and from staff and administration. So I think it's a it's a great celebration to have to be at that point with some of these efforts. Nice question. Sure. <laughs> it's waiting to be recognized. <laughs> um, celebrating the things that we've already done and then also looking forward. Very exciting. We are looking at hiring instructional coaches for next year. Are we on track for that? Have we posted those positions? Are we getting out? Put a pin in it because that's in, in mind. <laughs> I want to celebrate. They're all yeses in the end. Um, celebratory. Yes. So celebration. We, we don't. I just want to get us too far off track. Okay. Because that could all go in the bucket of supporting. It could go into the bucket of housing. I think that should. Okay. 
I, I do want to talk about it because I think that's one of the issue. That's one of the items that emerged during the year that wasn't anywhere on anybody's plan that we, we address. So I think it's worth a conversation, but we just stay on track and then miss. Sorry, I've been back. It's okay. So just on the supporting transitions piece, I think that's both um, supporting actual leadership transitions, which have breathed new life into work in some instances, um, given us a whole new perspective, but also slowed in terms of implementation in some areas. So you'll see on the chart that's more quant um, uh, quantitative in terms of what we've done and haven't done and where things stand, that part of the, one of the projects of the secondary this year was uh, mapping. That the, the team, even if they wanted to, was not in a position to begin digging in and, and, and mapping um, with their curriculum teams. They had to put energy into just getting to know the lay of the land. Um, they were first time principal and assistant principal in a new building. So it was something that wasn't ignored. It was something that had to be reprioritized. So that's an area where we didn't quite hit the mark that we wanted to, um, and that will turn focus to next year. So supporting supporting transitions and just getting people acclimated, I think, has been an, an all around team effort and, and one that has been successful because I think our, all our new members have had successful um, first years. And then we have some surprising community connections that we were ahead. That, that's one of the goal areas that we kind of saw that coming to fruition in 25. Um, but just by luck of different opportunities that presented themselves throughout the course of the year, we were able to start up. Um, the Arts Council, I think, is one that we put on the list, which also kind of goes into the rethinking bucket. Um, there is the group of town, for some reason, their name is escaping me, um, but they're the Arts Council in town. They've done some outreach and we're trying to forge a bond with them. Um, we've re partnered with um, the, the, uh, the countywide group out of Gloucester around wellness. So there's just um, been some really great opportunities to restart relationships. And a lot of this is fourth year after a pandemic, there things are really coming back into line. Um, and even rebooting things like um, Cape and caucus um, and uh, trying to get more meetings going again with the chamber and our legislators uh, region wide. So those are some themes and now just a little bit more meat on the bones and then well too long. So strategic initiative one is basically the curriculum instruction So I'm going to toss this to Heather. Okay, I think that piece what we were realizing here is that um, the strategic initiative one, I would say, you know, this is a bit of my transition and it's getting my hands around what an authentic meaning look like, sound like me, and what is shared understanding. That for me was a big growth area. So, you know, my transition of learning to like listening to understand where we were, probably put some pause on some of this. Um, and it's exciting because it feels like it's, we're really teed up to really lean into this in this upcoming year. Um, there's a lot of effort playing on that piece. So within that strategic initiative, the deliverables that are either fully completed or are on track for where we would expect them to be um, are including some of the pieces that Pam has already highlighted and noted. Like we ask, well, well, the elementary um, schools went through that opt-in opportunity at the elementary as it's that opportunity to structure self-study. Um, it's not done. We're going to actually have the site visits in October. We'll get really rich feedback from that, and then it will allow us to set those goals about how to continue to form that ongoing work. So the, the submission, which is an incredible effort by our um, elementary leaders, our teacher leaders, and the educators uh, completed that submission, that is something that will be continuing into the next year beyond. The multi-tiers is still support. Again, it's, it's, you know, there are aspects of it that are completed that are deliverables and continuing to grow and expand um, into next year, both in the breadth of what we're talking about when we're thinking about the social, emotional and attendance in addition to the academic and vertically we're expanding up partnership into middle school um, and beginning those conversations now. Pam highlighted some of the community partnerships, the, the restart, the wellness committees and other pieces. We've had a lot of um, re-energizing of some community connections and also some partnerships that we're fostering and building, which is really exciting. Um, and the professional development plan, um, what the teachers received two, two weeks ago was that forecasting of what that next year will look like, feel like with those different pieces, including summer learning opportunities, focus areas for next year, both that are complementing the work that we've done here and also targeting some you know, maybe shorter term needs based on student data or teacher data. Um, and then also projecting into like what structures can look like in the future. 
Um, so, so a lot of that is helping us towards that authentic learning and really centering that in what that and that as our driver for this upcoming school year. The piece that's in progress but behind is the secondary curriculum maps, but I don't I don't want this to. There are secondary curriculum maps. The, check, the reality is that those are not a task that you check off a list in our effort them. Um, so those pieces that that work has been done and it might be that things have changed or staffing has changed or course pathways have changed and need revision and updating, or it's possible that um, standards have shifted and some of the maps need to be revisited. So while there are maps, it's that again is one of those ongoing pieces. So I, don't, I don't want there to be a misunderstanding that there are no maps, but it's more that ongoing maintenance, updating, and revision. And I think the intended maintenance this time around was to look at look at inventory or existing authentic learning opportunities and identify areas where we need to either move things out and change them for the future, or um, areas where we might have deficit in our opportunity. So that's that's why that's tucked under. Yeah. Um, and that piece too, you know, that that paired complementary opportunity is, you know, like um, the week we get out of school, there's an uh, opportunity for like doing it just to teachers opting in their own summertime already into having a PD training on what does uh, inquiry based learning look like, sound like, and teachers who are already like opting in and excited. So there's a lot of great potential coming up, but yes, we're, this is a place that there's a lot of opportunity for growth. The piece would be considered, um, and I think that framing is helpful is what it doesn't mean is it's it's a no or a yes, but it was a, a pause in our pathway. So there was there was a pause for the um, coordinator position that we had that space and opportunity to shift into using the arts council structure to let us deeply examine what is our current arts and culture programming look like, sound like, how does it measure against um, some vetted rubric tools and guided through a process with DESE in partnership as a network with other districts. So that's actually allowing us to then move towards a quantitative measure of where our programming is and then lets us set goals. So that will also help us to inform um, what does that authentic learning look like sound like and then how do we make actionable steps um, in arts and culture across our district and across our classrooms. So and I think we just honestly and this is my my learning experience is that when we said arts coordinator, well, there were a lot of different versions in people's heads of what that was and what it meant and what the intended work of that individual was. So even though we did, when we drafted a, a description, it in further conversation, we we're finding it wasn't really putting the mark. So I think we're learning more about the problem we're trying to solve as we delve deeper. And that's why something like the arts council was a, a was a, I think a really smart reconsideration because it's going to give us a better perspective of what we're trying to solve for and how if we can get the resources for that position how we can structure a position that really can help us achieve um, what the perceived deficits are so and the next piece just to share is so that um connected to strategic initiative one so this is um the Various schools and levels last year worked through defining what does authentic learning mean and look like at an elementary, at a middle, and a secondary level. Um, and then there was some work last spring to bring those together. We revisited that as a leadership team as well to really make sure is this saying what we what it means for us? What does it mean for MERSD as a district? And and what is our expectation as we're moving towards it? So this is. This is our working definition as a district, and, and as we learn more and grow more, you know, there's opportunities for us to continue to come back to this piece. Um, but this is that definition that will be driving a lot of that work at, in those focus areas next year. And strategic initiative two, still more out of the curriculum office, and I think we've we were able to launch the SEL teacher leadership model. This is um, uh, the model that was outlined in the original ESSER grant. Where we will be looking to find two kind of keepers of light, if you will, at each of the elementary and the middle school. So these are K-8 roles charged with um, being kind of the people staying on top of the ruler research and any new implementations, training new people, and working to ensure that K-8 has a coordinated approach. What we did find is high school doesn't quite fit the mold, so we need to figure out a pathway um, for there. They are using pieces of it, it's just not, it, it does not seem to be able to be applied in the same way just because of the way um, the days are, the days and student time is structured. 
Um, the SEL needs assessment is ongoing and we will have um, Kim is leading has been leading that effort and she will have we will have a report out in the fall. We thought we would coordinate it with um, the school through with plans. They come up in the fall and the MTS has handbook. It's on track. I think um, I, I don't want to steal Heather's thunder, but I, I think if I'm hearing her correctly, they need to finish building the model before they memorialize it in the handbook. So think you have bits and pieces, but. Yeah. And it's, a, it's become a bit of an iterative process, but we think that we're doing the same thing. And then we, we have these, you know, an opportunity to have to do some deep data analysis process. We're like, oh, that is a little different. Can we seek to understand and clarify what we're looking for? So it's become this great, you know, what are those shared practices? And then we can go deeper and deeper. And deeper. So it's becoming really refined um, and in helping us to get really precise and making sure that the students are, our students are getting what they need. There's a consistent access to supportive resources across schools, across grades. Um, that we're being really effective with our practices and we're using a lot of the guidance. I'm guessing has a lot of really great guidance around MTSS. So we're actually using their MTSS self-evaluation rubric where are we having considered all aspects of this programming. So it's moving us through in a really comprehensive manner, not just what's the score, who gets how many minutes in really thinking in a, in a cohesive way. So um, the work is there, um, but it's it's actually, we, we've gone a lot deeper than I think maybe we had originally thought we would. Um, and it's giving us a lot of opportunity to ensure consistent practices and, and build coherence. You want to just keep going with MTSS and give a little bit of a snapshot on the vertical team, what it is, and kind of where we are. Yeah, yeah. So this has also been a really great opportunity um, to build that vertical conversation and connection. So as you know, um, we're in the second year of a vertical diagnostic assessment that allows us to look at data um, and student growth and student performance. K through eight. So having that consistent data set that multiple times a year. Um, and, and then also having started to build this historic trend of student performance using that tool will let us continue that conversation further. Um, and in partnership with the middle school leadership, they're looking at how have they traditionally provided intervention services and how can we move it through with our students coming up for you know, experience that MTSS process of that tiered intervention, make sure they're receiving supports in that tier one within the classroom, that tier two with the classroom teachers and a partnership with interventionists. And when there's targeted intervention at a tier two or three level, how is it provided? What information is used? How do we know what the need is? Um, so the partnership, well, it's it's slightly delayed. There has been a team created. Um, next week, we're actually having a vertical meeting where we're bringing in middle school staff, and collaborating with elementary staff to start the conversation of a transition, both students and practices. Um, and um, Joanne has been. Um, taking a really active role in re-examining looking like how does that sixth grade structure and teaming allow us the opportunity to build in that space as those students are transitioning, um, especially with that MSA as that that almost like a learning, a really open and flexible learning space for that. So there's a lot of great potential and we're, there's a little bit of playing in the sandbox for all the different ways that we could try to make sure we're doing that and how we're using frequent data review to make sure we're supporting those needs. So um, while it's, it hasn't, it's not done, um, we're in a really good spot to be taking it to that next. I'll just offer parent ed series was successful in that we got it off the ground. We offered um, a few sessions throughout the year. I think we're still struggling with participation. Um, Joanne was a real Joanne and the middle school council really took a, a lead role in this. Um, we thought offering online um, opportunities would drive up participation. It, not to where we would like it to be. So I think that's something we need to continue to, to uh, look at, study, and, and see if there are different ways that we can create outreach. Uh, one thing that we think would be helpful, but depending on who's presenting or offering the workshop isn't always available is recorded sessions because we'd be cutting into their earnings if we just recorded it and offered it. So I think we're we're happy that we got it off the ground. We're aware that it didn't quite meet um, the participation rates that we had before. So work to do on that. Um, and then the SEL scope and sequence and assessment is slightly different from the needs assessment in that, um, again, it's that documentation of where we are. And the assessment is designed to, I think what we're getting at in there that's different from just the general kind of where are our holes and what work do we need to do is how do we as assess the, um, the impact of the things that we're doing? So what's the long-term way in which we measure uh, whether or not our SEL model is having the outcomes that we need to. So we'll continue to put some work in there. 
And then three, and this is where we have done some reconsideration. Heather, I'll give you first crack. Is there something that jumps out that you wanted to comment on? I think this is that piece that what both the when this when this was being originally written and now I think this is probably a place that a lot of understanding of what's effective in the field has shifted. So even though there may be some deliverables, I think there's also a shift of you know having these conversations and understanding that a big piece of it was getting over that barrier of having difficult conversations that maybe people felt vulnerable to have. We're now in a place that we also understand to actually be thinking about cultural competency. It's not just about symbolic gestures. It's it's about making sure that we as a community understand what is culture, what does that mean, what does that look like, who's with us, who, whose voices are not being heard, and then how do we bring that in? So I think a big piece of this initiative has been an increase in growth that it's that it is not just um, symbolic days or transitions, although those are important and critical to celebrate publicly, but that our growth and understanding has shifted to really thinking about what does it mean when we're doing a curriculum review and how are we analyzing for um, equity. Using an equity lens in that component, but what does it look like? A big piece of our um, administrative council that could share have been going into classrooms or what are indicators of cultural competency when you're in a classroom and teachers and students are in there learning Spanish or learning math. What does cultural competency look like sound like in those rooms? So I, I think a big piece of this initiative, there's as Pam mentioned, been a lot of growth made, but I think also the understanding is that it's 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 far more than a few um a few days or a few pieces, but really how we approach things, what are we looking at and, and, and who's, who's in the works with us, adults, families, and, and students. And I think that's where the equity audit and consideration came in. Um, I think when we started crafting goals around this, equity audit was very, is a popular discussion point in a lot of districts. Um, we were advised and it's since become less common to do it because it, it it doesn't really get you where you're trying to go. We also realized um, we did a kind of a, I won't call it a mock version, we did a smaller version of it, of an inventory with the community last year through the school councils under the um, State and Support of Schools. Thank you, State and Support of Schools grant. We were given a tool by, I think you might remember us talking about it, we were given an assessment tool um, from DESE. And each of the school councils tried to implement it with small groups at the school. And we, the feedback was not positive. It's very cumbersome to use. A lot, I mean, we, I, I can even hear it with us now. There's just a lot of lingo. And a lot of the lingo was based, baked into the questions. A lot of the questions, to your point earlier, around the accountability issue. Everything's applicable, but a lot of the scenarios that they're looking for feedback on, we don't see in the day to day. So it, it did, didn't seem as a fit. So between inputs from Michael Eaton on what we could do, the experience of each of the school councils, we started to look at how do we how do we get at this information in, in a different way and vocal in the class, the vocal climate and the climate survey data is annual. We, we get it, it's there for us. We can promote it more to raise the numbers, but we think we can find the information um, in, a, in a tool that already exists. So that's um, why we reconsidered um, that particular issue. Any other comments or anything? I so just, go ahead. The only other piece I would say is, well, and there's nothing that's behind or, or in progress listed on here. It is continuing as part of the work next year. It just how where it lives and how it looks will be a little different than learning about it to applying it. And I think we'll just before we move into the to the finance and operation pieces, I think just trying to keep this visual in mind that those first three initiatives really work. Um, in harmony with one another and with two and three now providing some of the conditions under which we're going to attack on um, on the authentic learning piece um, because the tools that we've learned and we continue to build capacity around that are embedded in two and three are allowing our teachers to now pursue the more interactive learning um, so with that being said the next the visual as we transition into four is that the curriculum instruction are kind of the top of the, the pyramid operations and finance are what hold them up, right? So having stable, reliable financial basis allows us to plan, invest, continue momentum, um, and pursue our goals and objectives. And so, you skip the slide did you do that on purpose? Mm -hmm. No. Okay. Sorry, go for That's it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Did you want to share anything with that? 
Okay. <laughs> Go for it. Um, this, this is just another way where we're thinking about the other things happening, right? So the strategic plan drives our work and the district improvement plan gives us that roadmap of deliverables and our school improvement plan are on a more narrow. So we have all of these goals in the continued work on top of the day to day, making sure that our students and our staff are taken care of and engaging in academic um, happy learning environments and moving forward. And there was a lot of other really great things that were taking place this year that we thought were just weren't well, they wouldn't have fallen anywhere. Um, they definitely helped us continue to move forward. So um, the history of social science curriculum review, which is um, a, it's a long process and actually just was having some conversations with the teacher team this afternoon about it. Um, and two competitive grants, both for the investigative history and the genocide education, have really helped us to continue to push that work forward and, and they're helping us in plan for next year's um, next steps following that curriculum review. We mentioned that wellness committee rejuvenation, getting that up and started and ready to go for next year and some of their goal setting then. Um, the professional development has been a lot of new opportunities tried and this is a shout out to these teacher teams our professional development committee of teachers across schools levels and roles who have had a lot of ideas about how we can build these opportunities and cycles for ongoing professional learning i guess i mean i can geek out about that all night and i won't but it's been really exciting uh, to try different things so having a comprehensive um, website where you can go for anything you need some opt-in opportunities um and, and Renewing partnerships with external professional learning providers to make sure we're staying current and connected in our work. Um, the high doses tutoring that we've shared with you, both grant provided from Desi and also that we upped in um, at the Essex, the ELA curriculum mapping taking place at the elementary level to continue to build that coherent experience across both schools while also creating a vertical pathway. And um, a shout out to our secondary world language department who had an incredibly intensive year. Um, Jesse, following the release of the updated world language standard, they created these learning modules because the world language standards, it was not just when you teach things. It's the, like how you teach it, how you assess it, like full reset on this piece. And so this team went through um, these really robust training modules as a team to really build in their understanding of that foundational knowledge. Um, and three of our staff are going to a uh, network conference late June, and then, so they've all had the module training they've had that piece, and next year we're gonna be moving into the next phase of that curriculum process. Think about what is currently in our programming, um, what needs to be maintained, what needs to be, you know, revised, and then what is missing that we can build upon, um, and what does that look like for what we have, and also where we hope to go with returning some programming that maybe had existed previously, but in a way that's aligned. So, a lot of other good shout outs. Has there been any uh, like initial feedback on the high dosage tutoring? There's there's um, small. We get ongoing data to to let us monitor. Um, I have not data, had just you know who's been delivering it. If it's you know things like that. I I can talk about that. I, it could be a, going down a rabbit hole. So we we've been working with two partnerships about it. But I'm happy to actually write like a summary of our experience about it over this year to share back um, with people what worked but didn't. But they were both approved partners with DESI to provide that targeted high dosage tutoring following um, yeah. research. I'm sure if we just have gotten a little feedback from either parents, uh, you know, any feedback at all about Is it a hit or a miss? Right? Is it I would say I've had I've had mixed mixed feedback and experience. Okay. I think the level, the content and um, the the age mattered sure. um, with varying levels of perspectives of success. Oh. Yeah. Okay, now, budget as foundation. All right, sorry. No, no, no. <laughs> I, was gonna, I just don't want to repeat the whole thing. I think you know where I'm going with this. Um, and I, was, I guess I was surprised where we landed on initiative four because it sometimes feels like we haven't gotten the big prize which is a bit of a letdown, but yet we've accomplished everything we wanted to in spite of it. Um, so if the goal is to get, our number one goal is to get a correction, which we didn't achieve. So we've kind of gone around and tried to get there another way. I think it's, a, I'd like to talk with this group and it doesn't have to be tonight, but what do we want to do with that objective? Is it one that we need to reconsider where I'm placing it right now? Or is it something we think we, we have to pursue it the same way we pursued it before. So the MSBA piece, um, some of this is pre-Michelle, so central office job descriptions and hiring and the restructuring all kind of all came together. So 
all of the positions now have current job descriptions. I would say the two left to take a look at. Um, all positions that have been hired for in the past two years have new current descriptions. Um, Allison, the student services and superintendent job description are there, but they're they're older. They can use um, a look. Um, operations and maintenance planning is going along. I think our goal is to come up with a a simpler format. We have maintenance plans for this building and now one for Memorial School. They are large, so is there a way to synthesize them and make them simpler to follow? And kind of ensure that they're fed into our day to day work in a, in a more in a, in a more user friendly way. Um, but that work has continued on track and then uh, the inner review of staff to identify potential operating and financial efficiencies. That was a, a big part of our, I mean, it is every year, I think um, some years more so than others, but I think you have a, a perfect example of how we go about that built right into our budget materials reserve policy. I didn't know. I wanted to give us complete and on track, but <laughs> <laughs> I, think it's more on, I think we're more on track. I think it's, I think it's a tough one. It just, needs to be worked, it, it just needs to be worked through and it's a group effort. Um, and, and we're going to get there uh, in the reorganization of the curriculum support. Uh, that's the stipend group that I mentioned earlier. It's a JLM. That's another one that's behind and in progress, but simply because the TA had to, uh, Contract, which isn't anywhere on here, had to take priority um, this year. And just, you know, it's the same group of people trying to do all of the things. So um, it's just something that simply had to be reprioritized, but we're hoping to get a jump on it this year. We can talk, think about when we want to talk about um, budget funding correction as a goal. I think given where we are and, and the things that have changed just in terms of the landscape of the budget um, and the bigger projects on our list, that we may be looking at a, a multi-year approach that doesn't include a correction. So what are some creative ways we want to attack it going forward? And this was just, I basically just said that we were able to really get everything we wanted out of the FY25 budget by using our efficiency. And I think it's kind of taken on a negative connotation of late, but that we use that term just to talk about continually looking at what's out of date, what can be trimmed, what can be moved, how do we reinvest in ourselves by finding savings in, in areas which could stand to evolve in the way that they're structured and by, through that practice and being able to deliver right around to, I think it was 2.9%, we were able to rec, re, maintain the program that we have now, set the table for bringing back the pieces that we want to as we build the program to support them and also do something like hit an immediate need, which is let's get those instructional coaches because we're seeing things in the data that we think that will provide help with the problem. So I think we're in, in a good, believe it or not, a decent position financially, even though we have some structural problems or structural issues to dilemmas, I would say, to resolve. And then everything will be found um, on the web, the, the quantitative chart and the the color coded symbol where we are charts are all loaded up there already and you can take a look back at FY23. So all the words for questions. Yeah, so you can go in order if you have a lot of questions or you can just start with the show of hands. Go ahead, Teresa. I, I only have one question and it's actually a really easy one I think for Allison. Um, Way back at the beginning of this whole thing, let me just scroll back. It looks like the screen is frozen. The, uh, the new IEP and all the training and all of that, has there been an opportunity for our now newly reformed CPAP to get any extra training with that or to participate in any advanced understanding with resources or anything, not suggesting that they will take the place of, of you know, of course, the people who have to implement this, but knowing that there'll be a resource for parents to turn to in some ways. But is that something that we're doing or could do or yes, definitely it is a great idea um they both have agreed to be point people for parents on yeah. um, this year and i will be publicizing that as we go into the new year and i have done two parent trainings on the new IEP. they were not especially well attended which sounds like a theme that that yeah. pam was dealing with with the parent education series but they will be 
available to assist parents with that as as will will all of us. I it was interesting. We just started using the format, and one of the chair people was telling me that it was more. It was a little more. E it was a little easier and more intuitive than she actually expected in just transitioning to the new format. So so far it's going well. I think it it's very. I think in a lot of ways it's more clear than the other format um, for parents, but I, I do think that's a great idea. And that's a great use of those two people and their time to help as well. Nobody's going to show up to the presentation, but when they need to know the information, then they're going to they're find find somewhere to go to. That's yeah. right. I feel like every time I get one of these emails about a parent ed series, I'm really excited about it, and then. Most of them tend to be in the evening, which for parents of young kids is like total chaos. Mm -hmm. uh, sure. I know that there's never going to be no, I mean, like, I can make almost evening. like, like, I almost feel like lunch hour would be a better time for, um. I mean, that's so good. We can solicit feedback. Oh, that's really yeah. a good point. It's just always, I'm always. And we've tried to make weekend in response to things like that, like this year, with a couple of exceptions, we I would give us a minus. We decided at a uniform start time for evening activities. Now there are a couple that have been popped in based on past tradition. I think it's just a mistake or like seven o'clock for the um, senior awards. But I know they were trying to get kids back from things. So just so people don't check, like. Memorial school doesn't have to do it one time in the middle and another in the high school. So we had gotten that feedback over the years. Like it's it's hard to keep track of who does what and how. So we went with the uniform start time. Um, so if there's pieces of feedback with that, we're like, you know, it's always good for us to hear when you try to make adjustments. So daytime for a long time, mornings were the opportune time for PTO meetings. Um, so maybe we can move it. So uh, thank you for the overview and I want to acknowledge and recognize both the scope and the range of activities that are going on and, and how many I'm sure that individuals are involved in at once. Um, so I appreciate that. My question, if you step back from the list of things, how would you describe kind of the outcome or the impact that those processes have had, in other words, kind of what's what's different for student experience or what are teachers doing differently because of these things? My, my piece, honestly, there's, there's not as much of an impact on the student experience as the parent experience. I think with the new IEP, the one piece for students, and I think it's a very important piece, is that every student will be asked to articulate their vision. And that wasn't required in the same way with the old IEP. So whether you're an elementary school uh, child or you're a high school student, we will be asking you to articulate your vision. And I think that will be an important experience. Um, other elements, I think, are going to have more of an impact with parents. Um, and my, as for my many compliance tasks that I have had to do as a late, I would say, unfortunately, the impact on students is not really significant. It's more of a technical exercise that we need to go through. If we were wildly out of compliance and we needed to um, clean up our act, with that, then that could potentially have an impact on the student experience, but it's very much. Sorry to say it's just more of like a technical bureaucratic process that we have to go through. I think others piece is much more exciting <laughs> because there is a real impact on student learning and engagement with what you're doing. And I, I'm so proud of my department and everything that we do and the successes we have with students, but some of these technical pieces, it, it, you're not, it, it's not as quality oriented. It's more, it's much more just procedural technical. Um, you However, have way more to say. Yeah, but you know what, what I will say too is that I think 
in processing your question, my initial reaction is the impact on students is, I think, with each activity we're engaging in in a global way, students are having a more consistent and higher quality experience. Uh, you know, a lot of the questions we talked about this year about like building like coordinated professional learning across all staff members and how do we create differences based on staff member and staff role needs, but also things like the schedule alignment across the elementary schools and the multiple meetings with that scheduling team and the analysis of the time and is that so. I think with each of these steps, I think what students are experiencing is an increased um, experience, an increased consistent experience, no matter what teacher or um, building or grade or department they're in. And what I don't mean is everything's the same, but I mean that their experience is more predictable and that it's increasing their ability to do the hard stuff, right? Because if you're spending your time on the technical, on the compliance, or learning what rules are here. I think the principals modeled it well today, right? If like if your attendance is a little different than yours or how you do it is a little different, you can get stuck in that instead of like being here matters and what do I need to be here, right? So project that into learning. Um, if we if our teachers are all engaging in UDL access, then how do we make sure our classrooms are consistently accessible? And how are all of our teachers getting the professional learning where they're at to move their practice forward as the students go through those classrooms, they can expect that whether I have Allison or I have Heather, I have Michelle for my teacher, um, that experience, I'm going to have access to those in a consistent manner because that's what we do as a district. So I think it, sort of globally, I think it's moving us towards shared expectations of high expectations, um, really engaging rigorous work, but like opportunities for continued growth for our students and our staff. Um, and I hope that that just continues to increase. Maybe a little too theoretical, so push back if it's too much. I would say really like, well look over time. History. Yeah. Okay, so <laughs> we've moved from a uh, from questioning to accepting and embracing the need to work coherently among the rainbow. So it's very similar to what Heather's saying, except I'm noticing that the teacher language is in the teacher perspective is catching has caught up. So we're doing less explaining about why we need to get on the same page. Um, and more, how how can we do this in a way? Again, it's like what Heather says that respects the cultures in each of the buildings, but ensures um, consistency in expectations and delivery of instruction. I think in the walkthroughs we saw, um, you know, if you've been around for the process, we are at implementation now. Out and how can we do it better is definitely a question, but literacy is no longer in question in terms of moving toward a more um, science of reading based approach. It, it, it's being exercised and people are trying to figure out how to make improvements and, it, and do it in a way um, that creates better results because it's the same thing around the FBSS. So I think you mentioned, you know, third year, we'll be in the third year of the schedule. There's still many better ways we can implement that schedule, but I think there's there's an understanding now of why we moved to it. So I think it's exciting. I think the the idea of the instructional coaches were really positively received, which is a good indicator from my perspective that they're ready, we're ready to focus on that aspect of the work. And then I just think big picture and no data points, but just observationally, students are present and active in communicating and their voices heard. And while the authentic experiences may not be as structured or evolved as we want them to be, there's increasing opportunity to, for the student to be the teacher and the student to be actively involved in what they're learning. Um, at all levels. And I think that's really exciting. Um, and I, it's an exciting time because we also have fresh perspective on how to do things. So I think we're in a really great position to kind of launch into this next three year plan um, and, and start to see some of the I think you a lot came on during a lot of foundational work and how now we can build on that foundation because I think the cultural competency work has helped them gain um, perspective around in, in, inclusion themes that we've been sounding for years. So it's giving us giving us another thing. So I'm excited. Thank you. Um, I'm going to uh, you know put comments. I echo actually the same thing you know from. The three years that I've been here and in, involved in this, uh, you know, I think you've been sidetracked a 
couple of different times, or there's been uh, competing priorities sometimes. But uh, you know, from what I've seen so far, we're at a point now where it really does seem like we have a pretty solid foundation, and I'm looking forward to seeing what accelerating that. So, thank you. Very much for all of your work. Okay. The rhythm is back, and I think that's what I heard teachers saying the other day. It's been a year without some major external thing, and it's just been a year of doing the work. Um, we used to do this at the end of every year. We haven't done this at the end of the year since 2019. So it feels good to get back to some of um, the academic and educational um, routines and reflection points. So, so. We could talk about this all night. Yeah. All right, so we need to go back to the super report. Yeah, and I can, uh, I'll try not to repeat because they were tied together somewhat. Uh, yeah, eight minutes. I can do this. <laughs> So, <laughs> no, I can do it. So, we'll start with the congratulations of the class of 2024. Great graduation. Um, I wish Julie were still here because I just wanted to give her and, and, and Liz a shout out. They did a fantastic job. We had, you know, some things to wrestle with during senior week, but I think um, given what they what they had to manage, the week was an overall success and. Um, Juniors are ready to step up and begin their senior year. Uh, so that that was a great week last week. And now we have grade five and eight moving on ceremonies coming up next week. I won't go through the dates, but take a night next week and you can see a fifth grade or an eighth grade moving on ceremony. Um, so those those are wonderful. Um, I mentioned already that we got tapped. We are going to get the district review. So, like I said, plenty of information to build our district improvement plan um, in the following year. And I can give you a quick update on my goals in a second, but because we've talked a lot about what's already in there, I'm going to jump to say, why isn't this working? Just switched. Hmm. Okay. What I have in front of me is an Essex Elementary Building Project eligibility. That's at nine o'clock because it's just <laughs> right. eligibility period update. Um, so you know, box check. The building committee has been seated. Um, they will begin work in the late fall of next year. I get a couple of inquiries, so if you do get questions, once we pass through approval to move to the next stage from MSBA, we'll call them in and start the work. Um, and we would reminder we'll be adding a faculty member to that group in the fall. This uh, feasibility study funding appropriation is complete. It was completed at the end of our last meeting with the vote in Manchester, but that box is checked. We communicated that to the MSBA and now they're sending us the funding agreement documents. It's just paperwork that Michelle and I need to fill out. And we have submitted all of, all of the enrollment data and educational questionnaire um, and the education questions were submitted. So they have everything they need for us to work on their enrollment projection. Now we're just waiting for a call from them for a meeting. Could be end of June, July. The, everyone's summer schedules will, will play into it. Um, but they'll get us in sometime in the next couple of months to kind of go over what they're seeing in terms of enrollment projections for a build, a design build um, for the project. That's an initial, and things can change. So we've had to submit everything from building starts to project, long term projected housing projects. So they're going to put it all through their process and, and come up with some numbers. And that when we get that report, we'll distribute, um, we'll distribute that to everybody. We have one more piece that's owed to them, and that's the operations and maintenance um, questionnaire, and it's just some details on our practices. Those practices can factor into additional points in terms of reimbursement. So on the memorial project, I think we got one or two additional points because we had solid practices for maintaining our buildings. So that's things like long-term planning, capital management, having you know maintenance cycles and resources to ensure that we just because you get a brand new building, you don't do nothing for 15 or 20 years. Um, so that's about it on, um, on the building process. I just wanted to get you up to speed there. On the goals, um, I don't know that you ever officially voted them, but I've been working on these on these things throughout <laughs> the year. Um, and, 
they're pretty, I think they're well aligned to the district improvement work that's going on and tries to zero in on my piece, which is kind of to build really working with the leadership team to build their capacity around. Um, we're doing a lot of work around the student observation piece because to Jake's question, that's going to be our inroad to. That's a tool for monitoring and providing feedback to improve student achievement. So what we're trying to do is reset the table. We have new members. Everybody's coming in with different um, backgrounds. So we're trying to go. Through. Our goal next year is to participate together in a core set of learning around how to do effective observation and evaluation. For some of us, it'll be a repeat, but it's been a while. Um, for others, it may be their first time going through that. So we're working. Um, I'm working to identify. With Heather, I'm working to identify who is going to be the best uh, facilitator for that work so we can build on the walkthrough that we did this year. So we meet about two times a month, um, sometimes more, sometimes for specialty meetings, but at least one session a month is dedicated to teaching and learning. Um, through those sessions, we spent time in classrooms, so we're going to build on that for next year. Um, I guess I, I did mention earlier that my goal was 80% of all the deliverables we hit. 78 on curriculum and 77% on districts. So I'll let you make the judgment there. Um, competitive side says I didn't make the mark, but I think we, I don't feel like we're woefully behind it. And I think we are making a lot of forward progress. Um, I, I think the ones I wrestle with the most are the ones that we work together on. And it's around kind of what is the best strategy going forward with the budget. Um, we'll solve that tonight. And the one I'm actually really interested in working on. And committed is a library piece, but with the transitions that happened this year, I had it originally envisioned starting it up around November and using the back half of this year and into the fall to try to set a plan for preparation for next year. But that coincided with obvious departure. So I, I just simply got sidetracked and had to reprioritize. Um, but looking forward to it for next year and feel good that we've been able to get at least the library PAs to mind the store, so to speak, and um, Breathe some life back in uh, to the to the library spaces, and I think it's also I think that step has actually started to engage some excitement because people are having conversations around what it could be. And I think, you know, you've heard me say before, we haven't. This has not been a vocalized priority from any of the principals going forward. I think we're growing concerned just about how the space is being used, but in, but as they're conversing with people, I think their vision of what it could be we're kind of stuck on the vision of what it was and we know we don't want that so i think being able to build towards something new and innovative is going to be our inroad in um you kind of on the bottom i identified the district improvement goals that were going to be my focus area so you've heard where our status report on that i think that sums it up happy to take questions any questions for ben? One question. Short question. Percentage wise, how would you quantify having to reprioritize based on a new director of finance and operations, a new director of curriculum and instructional technologies, high school principal dean, uh, changing elementary principal, changing middle school dean, finalizing a unit aid contract, and a new unit aid contract? How would you, would, it, would you say that's two to three percent <laughs> of a delta? <laughs> like, is it legit? You're the numbers person. Do you think that's that's, 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 that's fair to say that that 77 to 78 is? I don't. I don't give it. Give it away on that. I think the, my crazy answer is that's why we have the plan. So it doesn't where we're going and how we're trying to get there isn't going to fluctuate because Michelle came in and Abby went out, or Heather, or um, Julie and Liz, or Kim shifting up. What's, it's the relationship side, right? So they know what the mission is, but they have to establish the relationships and the understanding of the environment to figure out how they're going to advance the goals. Um, so I think that's where we lose a step. That's why we kind of put some of the things in the box. They're, they're going, they're not like, oh shoot, we didn't even think about that this year. It's more like there was just no way we could force this point. So I don't know. I'm not well, I'll push back and just say, you don't have to pick a number on it, but um, <laughs> when we go through this, this whole presentation tonight and see everything that's been accomplished in the last two years from our perspectives and from, from 
actual, you know, understanding of what's going on and you're reporting out on your goals. I, I would be remiss if I didn't say you've done a stellar job leading us. So thank you. It's a team effort. Just a team. <laughs> and there's a lot that still needs to go. But I appreciate it. So if you're trying to be All right. Anyone else? Chuck. Okay, thank you. Eric. Uh, school committee comment. This felt very productive and um, celebratory. I think it's really nice to see quantifiable progress that aligns with my kids' experience in school. Um, I did have hiring originally on here and then took it off. Oh, yeah. But you promised <laughs> <laughs> One, we're almost complete with one. So candidates have been identified. We did repost for literacy. So they're going through a second round of interviews there, but it's all moving along and I think they're excited about the person they're inviting to join the team. Great. So we will be operational for the bottom. All the hiring is gone. I did have one more small piece of business after the comment. It's just scheduled. Sure. Mine is that probably we made it scheduling to it. We have a relatively large summer bucket list. We have not been successful in the past couple of years of meeting that list. I'm wondering how we how we structure and I'm not asking to answer it today, but since this is our last meeting before then, how do we get to a place where we can Consider that set. I don't have an answer right now, but I can make a suggestion. I want to recognize it. Well, go ahead. Give a suggestion. Just that if we if we kind of take and review the list, that the idea there, at least to me, is when we put stuff there, then we triage based on like taking a look and seeing these are the things we still okay. care about in the order in which we do that. Some of that can be done through email, through, you know, that sort of thing. Um, but in the end, Chris and Pam are gonna need to meet and um, prioritize um, how we spend our, our um, training time this summer together too, and depending on her schedule. Well, and that's what I'm, so we have August 6th as the workshop day and then time TPD. So is it a three hour morning session? Is it a full day? So that's up for the group to decide then my scheduling problems continue August 20th. I can't do a night meeting. My family has scheduled something long in advance for that night. Um, and we didn't check that it was the third Tuesday. Um, so I could kind of do an afternoon session if we just need to do some bill paying or business check in. We could try to reschedule it or we could do what we did last year, which is push everything to the 1st September meeting. Cause I don't, I don't even know if we have a quorum at this point. So, cause we didn't have a second meeting in August last year. We just didn't have enough people. So sorry for the complication, uh, but I'm flexible to fix it. So I don't know how we want to approach. We can uh, talk and see if we can organize via email. People want a longer session to give us a little sense of how to a longer session on the 6th or a shorter session on the 6th. I'm always in favor of shorter anything. However, I will say it's the one time a year that we have the opportunity to really work like, you know, in a big way. So for this, I am in favor of a, a longer session for based on availability. So I, um, I, if I remember correctly, last August when we had a workshop, I think uh, whether short or long, it might be helpful to know ahead of time if there's going to be other stuff that is going to be Doing, uh, that's happening. I think last time we spent a lot of time on the training stuff. Um, you know, I personally didn't. I, I personally feel like we should have. I, we could have used more time on the regular work stuff. I don't think you have anything on your list this year. We did. We didn't have anything planned in advance of like bringing Michael back to work with us again. That was a, a one that was supposed to yeah. originally be a December introductory right. to kind of what was. We were working on. I also don't think that 
as a committee, we've been together now a bit. So I think that just in and of itself will help. How do you choose what, um, you know, the sum of the list? How, what's the process to decide what gets discussed at, the, at this meeting? That's a very good question. You literally go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't do any prep on that. So, um, just in, in general, I mean, yeah. and you can speak to it. I was just wondering, like, if, if we have things that we really raise to the top, should we be emailing Chris or yeah. is this Pam? Is it at your discretion? I think all mine. Did I remember at some point Teresa having us ranking? Um, and I don't think that it was the bucket list, but it was some something else that we were trying to prioritize. And she's from the um, yeah. yeah, and she had us rank them in order of importance, and then she compiled that and prioritized based on the consensus. Microsoft Forms makes it pretty easy to do these things. You could do something like that. I, I can't remember what's on the list, but at this point, after like you said, a couple of years, is it worth taking a look at the list in terms of what's something the committee wants to put on? Like, is it this is put it on our radar screen? We'd like to hear or learn more about it versus action. Like, what can you take action on? What is it that's a kind of a curiosity um, that you'd like to learn more about? And what is it that you feel like you need to convey because you're hearing a lot about it and don't know where, what we don't know what to do with it? And there may be things that some of us do not feel we need to put our attention to. And again, when we when these things come up, we say, well, we can address that down the line. But it, it, some of the time that has meant, we can decide if that's something we need to take action on. Mm -hmm. We could just go through a facilitated process of what the heck to do with the list. Sorry. Before before the August uh, workshop or during the August? During before. The August. I, think, well, I mean, I could. We can start before. I would think. Because sometimes it's hard to facilitate your own group. So, you know, we have lots of experts who could just come in and for an hour kind of say, Okay, you've had this list that's been banging around for a while. What, what's the problem we're trying to solve? Where do these things go? And kind of someone objectively taking us through it. So the email that you sent out recently for that list is that the latest one that we can add on to it? Or? It's the it's the Excel document that Teresa set up. It's a new tab, same bucket list. So what's the process? Do we email you? Do we add them to the list? Or how does that work before? But the the list itself is just a documentation of all the things that we've agreed will go right. into the summer bucket list. I'm hearing something different, which is if you have a if you have a preference for things to be sure get attended to or that you would like to advocate for, sounds like we should let yeah. Chris know what those are. Yeah. yeah, I think we can do it both ways, right? We can prioritize what's there, maybe drop a few things off. It's not a priority of the committee any longer, and then we can also you know, we always should be adding to that list or maybe not adding to the list necessarily, but at least everyone should be surfacing, you know, what they think could be a beneficial use of our time during the day. Right. And revisiting the list. Like I'm looking at yeah. it right now and thinking about where I was when I put some things on this list yeah. and where we are now. It's it may not be relevant anymore. Priorities have changed, but can I make a suggestion that sure. we give Chris and Kate a minute to breathe on this, to think about it, and then confer with Pam and then come up with a plan that they can then let us know how they want us to give them that feedback? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm thinking the ranking form might be helpful just to at least get an order in which to attack. There's a question about process. Um, <laughs> I remember last year the evaluation that the superintendent was like super late. So is, is there a specific time that we're supposed to give you the evaluation? Is that it is the summer homework? Is it next year? Okay. Yeah. We're midway two year. in the two year cycle. Okay. This is just a mid year or mid cycle update. Okay. Yeah. That's why it's not all of the it was just the goals for time, not all of the other things. Just a last quick comment. I'm looking forward to supporting this committee this year and look forward to continuing to work with everyone to continue the great work that uh, Gary did. So, 
Thank you for your bus. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? I turn the air connection. Yeah, so yeah. fine. That's the equipment. The lights up. We don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. You can fit it.